Everybody, welcome. It's me, the Miller Load. We're on In the Keep here at 3D Realms. Uh, awesome Realms DeepCon 2020. However you want to call it, Fred. You want to introduce it? What's up, guys? This is Cliff Kositsky. <laughs> this is Fred Schreiber. This is it. We're starting it off. This is the first interview. Yay. Yay. Thanks for having us, Ty. You're very welcome, dude. I'm, I'm happy to have you here. The first thing that I want to get into is just kind of lay it out like this. Like Usually when I do these interviews... I uh, will start off slowly kind of working up through someone's career. But Cliff, you've done everything and you've been interviewed a million times and I don't really want to just like go point by point through every game you've ever done. I'd rather kind of get to know you as a guy and I think that's what your fans will want to do too. Yeah, thanks, man. It's, uh, I'm, I'm currently writing my memoir, and uh, it's, it's essentially like, you know, when you're fighting yourself, it's like fighting Dark Link. And it's like unpacking like, 25 plus years of experience and like you know talking to my writing partner he's like what were you doing in 1994 in that moment i'm like i don't freaking know oh by the way can i swear yeah you can cuss all oh yeah he- hell yeah it's realms deep i know i know we I invented know. swearing in video games i can't I- but yeah sorry ty I, I i cut you off a little bit there no go ahead no please seriously uh, this is about you it's not about me i'm just facilitating no it's it's just you know it's it's one of those things that you know I was talking to Fred before you got on about the current state of the industry, mm-hmm. and I, I don't want to sound like the jaded guy who's like, I made enough money, I'm taking my ball and going home. i just not the biggest fan of the, what, the way the industry is these days, um, which is why I think the retro stuff has become such a thing. You know, uh, you know, I look at, you know, the videos of, you know, uh, the new Unreal Engine. I look at, you know, PlayStation 5 and I'm like, I'm just going to go play Animal Crossing now, yeah. you know, or, or you know, it's so funny because, you know, tying into the retro uh, theme of what you've been doing um, and, and, and Fred's been doing to some extent is that uh, I'm actually getting checks on Jazz Jackrabbit, like yeah. decent checks from goodoldgames.com, like Epic's honoring their contract which is ironic because I'm not getting any money off of Fortnite because I was technically an employee. And uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um, yeah. It's uh, the thing about Fortnite is I always say is uh, it's kind of like dating Taylor Swift before she became Taylor Swift. And yeah. then everywhere you look, you see fucking Taylor Swift and you're like, God damn it. It's like, and if I see it, if I see one more kid floss, I'm going to fucking lose it. It's like you when know? Reznor wrote hurt and then Johnny Cash did hurt. And it's like, that's not your song anymore, dude. Get out of here. Dude, this is well the same thing happened with my wife and uh you know, we're twelve years apart. And uh when Alien Ant Farm redid a uh, Smooth Criminal mm-hmm. book by Michael Jackson and I, I played Smooth Cri- Smooth Criminal for her and she's like, Oh, this is Alien Ant Farm. I'm like So anyway, uh no, it's uh retro is in, you know. There, there's a reason why uh people like their vinyl, you know, and so the games that I play these days are generally, you know, lighter and simpler because as I was telling Fred before you came on. You know, when I see these these new game demos, uh, all I see is the money on the screen. I see. I wonder how many developers have been worked to the bone. I wonder, you know, how many families have been ruined. I wonder how much money is being thrown towards the marketing. I wonder what tricks they're doing to keep people playing that as one game to rule them all. And it just it puts me off. You know, we have this amazing game room upstairs with our, our consoles, and the last game we played was Knights and Bikes by Double Fine because it's yeah. like tiny and cute. You know, so. Yeah. Like I just sometimes less is more, and that's uh, you know people love to throw my failures in my face. Although you know I've had more successes than failures, um, but Bosky Crumbling, the studio that I did, broke my heart. And if I could go back in time, one thing I would do: it, the first game we had made, I would have made something small and hipster and yeah. indie, even retro, right? Instead of trying to shoot for AAA and get, only getting to like double A with what we did with Lawbreakers. So. Thanks I for think that, that also hit that, that you know really really bad timing where everyone was trying to as as you mentioned earlier in our, our talk uh, you know to be the next Candy Crush and you're so you're trying to ride this wave of okay what what are what are we going to do that's the next popular thing and how how are we going to make a twist on it and again there there's one Overwatch there's one Fortnite and everyone else is kind of fighting uh, fighting against the the crumbles yeah they're, 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 the they're, they're, well it's a, yeah I made the call on my blog years ago. Where I said the video game industry, when it comes to AAA, it has turned into the American uh, restaurant industry. Mm. Let's take the pandemic and put that over here for a second. Um, and you know, where you know, you look at the American-made restaurant industry. It's Olive Garden, Outback Steakhouse, Chili's, uh, Cheesecake Factory. Everything else is like tiny and indie. And so you have your Call of Duty, your Assassin's Creed. If you're not an established brand right. uh, or or something that goes viral uh, with with the kids, then you're you're fighting for scraps. 
you know, and it's it's a really really complicated tough business. Um, and for the time being, I'm absolutely happy that I don't have to be in it because um, I've run it. I, you know, I sit there with game developer friends of mine having a pint, and I see the thousand yard stare in their eyes. You know, it's it's like I tell them, if you can get fuck you money and get the fuck out. As much as I love video games and they've defined who I am and they've been good to me, it's like I am making them, you know, takes a toll. I've seen so many game developers like Obama go prematurely gray, you know, and that's that's a result of stress, man, you know. So anyway, what, I've hijacked this. What, what, what do you think about um, about this differentiation between the uh, the the triple A blockbuster single player type games and then the the hip games like or the trendy games like Overwatch, League of Legends, because I, I I have a few nephews myself and and the funny thing is they are all into gamer PCs and gamer chairs and RGB lighting, but they know of two games, maybe three. They only play Fortnite, maybe a little bit of Call of Duty and may, maybe some FIFA. And they don't know about anything else and they're not interested in anything else or any anything else in AAA, like Outer Worlds and all these games. They don't care at all. And that's very different, I think, from when You know, I grew up playing games like uh, when I was a teenager, playing uh, the first Gears of War and so on. Because then you were playing all these AAA games. But if we if we go back to shareware, you know, like the, one of the things I'm mentioning in my book is that as a young dude who was working at McDonald's, you know, and trying to make video games, um, like shareware was a great way to have this amazing kind of you know sampler of everything that was out there, you know, from platform games eventually to 3D and everything and beyond. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I, I just, I was a Hoover, you know, back to, you know, like to the point where I beat, you know, so many games back in the Nintendo because, you know, I used my paper route money back in the day to to buy those games. You, you um, were a Nintendo World Championship, right? Yeah, I was, uh, I came in second in the state of Massachusetts. God, what, um, like 92 or something like that? Uh, 1990. I was 15. 1990. My God, yeah. that's incredible. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty seminal year because uh, it was the year my dad died, the year I lost in the Nintendo World Championships. The year my nephew was born, um, you know. Thank God for therapy. There's a lot to unpack there, but you know, it's it just you know, I wanted to be somebody. You know, I wanted to. I always said I got into this industry for three reasons. I wanted to make great games. I wanted to make money, and I wanted to be known for it. And now, with what's happening, I remember back when I first uh, got unplugged from the matrix of just sitting around making games all day long, and I actually started going into public in Raleigh with one of my friends who wasn't much of a gamer. Um, I just I remember t trying to tell people what I did. You know, I made these these games Unreal and Unreal Tournament, and you know, trying to act, sound all cool. And they never gave a shit. You know, it's a small southern town. Yeah. Um, but you know, if I found anybody that said they played games, he'd be like, I play Madden, I play GTA, and then WoW came along. I hear and you. Then, <laughs> and uh, my wife st is still playing WoW Classic, and it drives me crazy because I have never seen a game more surgically des designed to be addictive and to suck time out of you. And every, but then I, every time I look over at her, like, it's just like, she has like Netflix on one monitor and then like, she's watching that, but like, she's just like on a mount, like traveling somewhere. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like, and it's, but you can't argue it. It's a phenomenon, you know? And I'm like, I was like, girl, I played, you know, uh, Ultima online back in the day. <laughs> and, and that shit was brutal. You could like dismember somebody and then watch their ghost, you know, standing next to you going, Ooh, right. Like, and the lag was horrible in that game. Like. Um, you know, I never, that was like the only MMO I ever got into because I, you know, uh, as I said, you start to see the systems behind everything. You start to see the deliberate time sinks. You see the get more achievements and like, as you know, the only game I'm really playing much right now is Animal Crossing, which came along at the perfect time with the pandemic and everything going on in the world right now. Um, but I still, like, I see like all the busy work that's implemented into that game. And it's just, you know, keep the disc in the tray, keep you playing one game to rule them all. You know, and it's, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's the state of, uh, of the, of the industry. And, you know, like the whole Fortnite thing, you know, it's like, you know, it was one of the most brilliant pivots to essentially, I mean, no offense, clone PUBG, um, but with the, the, you know, the art style. And it's so funny. I think about my former employer, Epic, and the fact that, you know, they have an agenda of pushing the, the technology, you know, forward. Um, you know, but Fortnite is still like has that kind of like simple, almost like yeah. you know Wii style to it. You know, let's switch kind of Nintendo-ish style to it, which is appeals to the kiddos. Um, and you know, something else about the state of the industry that makes again, I'm sounding jaded, but uh, I'm, I've always been pro developer. You know, like I've always wanted developers to be recognized and to make money. And uh, it, you know, kind of bugs me a little bit 
that some Twitch streamers, uh, again, that's an exhausting gig, um, and some pro gamers are making more money than many developers I know will ever make in their entire life. And it, it feels like we're in the upside down. And this is probably me saying, get off my lawn. But uh, yeah, you know, I've seen some shit. <laughs> but isn't that also the magic of, of the games industry being a creative industry? You talk about, you know, your Broadway and, and, and Karogi, as, as we discussed earlier. It's a thing that you just can't help it, even if you, like, I'm, I'm sure you know, if no game developer ever made any money, they would still make games because they just can't help themselves. It's, you know, it's that, a creative that, expression. It, it is, but that's also part of the problem. You know, yeah. because, you know, you got to eat, you know, exactly. and, and also what happens with a lot of these game developers um, is they blindly si sign employment contracts without reading them. Mm. You know, they in, you know, there's the old saying, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. And I am lucky, you know, Tim Sweeney and Mark Rain were very good to me. Um, other developers aren't so lucky. Um, you know, when I started Boss Key, the first 20 employees got actual stock not stock options, they got actual pieces of the company. Uh, it wasn't huge because I myself wanted to maintain the majority share, but I wanted to reward them for taking the risk on the studio that sadly, you know, crumbled because the first two years of that studio were amazing. The last two years, well, year and a half, were utterly stressful and were hell for me trying to be the front man to a studio that was uh, slowly circling the drain and, you know, watching the daily active users go down, uh, seeing the sales numbers, watching you know, the uh, amount of money that was in the bank. I hope to never be a CEO ever again because it was the most taxing experience of my life. Hey, so can we talk retro shit now? Like, yes. Yeah, let's do it. We, we throw this term retro around, like retro shooter, boomer, all this kind of stuff. And the fact is that you guys are old as shit and I'm 25 years old and I'm not one of you. So I still like this stuff. One of the things that we talked about a lot when we were putting this whole convention together was oh you know we want to move it we don't want to be like competing with some of these triple a title releases that are coming out and all this kind of shit and then i had to like stop the room like guys you're not in competition with them like i don't give a fuck about the i don't care about the last of us 2 i'm not even i don't even touch my playstation except as a blu-ray player i'm one of these people that just i love this style of game and i like what i like and this is what i go for uh there's a reason why I do a whole podcast about exactly this sort of thing, and I support the shit out of 3D Realms, out of New Blood, out of Night Dive, out of Running With Scissors, like all these amazing studios that are, you know, they're not in competition with that. Uh, we talk about a guy like you, Cl like Cliff, you've done it all. You've come from the bottom to the top and back again and every way, everything, and it's really amazing to me that you've kept your kind of level head, and something else that you touched on earlier was how you started off, you know, scraping it at mcdonald's and you wanted to be somebody and i wonder with a guy like you like what keeps you going what keeps you motivated um What's well it? right now right for me right now again not wanting to make it games anytime soon mm -hmm. um it's still like you know I've, I've always been a huge fan of the uh old school rapper ice t and he has a line from one of his raps where he's uh, he's talking about like writing his rhymes and he said, you know, on, on paper, and he says, the white paper and blue lines excite my mind, not allowing me to stop the rhyme until the whole motherfucking book's complete, mm -hmm. then I write in the back of the sheets. And for me, um, oh, somebody popped in. <laughs> I told you this is going to happen. Get out, Scarecrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he just left this. Um, sitting there with a, a, a clean Microsoft Word document. And um, and just typing, you know, the whole like it was a dark and stormy night thing, you know, like uh, creating a, a world, creating characters, creating mechanics. Um, you know, one of the things when I, you know, was in in the zone with making games that I loved was typing up a, a description of an environment, and the and of course the history or a character, and then seeing the the concept art like come out of it, and then seeing it come to life. Um, you know, maybe it's the whole thing. There's an old Alec Baldwin movie called Malice about uh, doctors and whether or not they have a god complex. And it, you know, it's there's this amazing monologue you can look up on YouTube where at the end of it, Alec Baldwin says, "You ask, you ask me if I have a god complex. Let me tell you something. I am God." And you know, I I'm not I'm I'm honestly an atheist. Um, I believe we're in the fucking matrix, but I believe that uh, if there is a god, the best way to honor that god is to create. Not just um, you know uh, you know kids and shit, but also to like you know paint, to 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 write, to do poetry, to do music, uh, to do video games, 
And, you know, I'll never forget uh, the first time Tim Sweeney sent me the editor for Jazz Jackrabbit because I couldn't I didn't couldn't figure out how to code uh, C++. You know, I'm relatively smart, but I am not, not not that smart. I could do visual basic. Tim Sweeney, one of his many, many billions, ironically, of strengths um, is the ability to spot creative people and to provide the tool set for them to make a better car or whatever. Um, and, you know, he saw the editor that Ardian Bruce, uh, who is my partner during Bosque, who's now at Epic, again, full circle. Um, it was incredibly easy and intuitive to use. And I had managed to teach myself Deluxe Paint 2. And the feeling of cobbling together those tiles with little jump pads and the, and little, you know, weapon power-ups and my, my first version of the cobbled together rabbit that I did together, like, and then actually having audio hooked into that. It was high, unlike anything that I'd ever had. You know, it was the whole like Frankenstein. It's a live moment. Um, you know, I'm a big musical nerd, um, and there's a line from one of my favorite musicals, Rent, and there's a bit called La Vie Bohème, and they talk about the need to express, to communicate, to going against the grain, and not necessarily wearing a three-piece suit every day to work. You know, and we felt like the rebels. You know, and we felt like, you know, it was the, the wild, wild west when it came to the shareware days. Um, and, you know, here's one of the things that gets me about that era, by the way, that pisses me off in hindsight, is the fact that, like, so many parasitic retailers would take the shareware versions and of the games and they'd sell the shareware in stores with, like, <laughs> with, with, like shitty art. And, like, it's like, it, because we were, you know, maybe your average person didn't have an internet connection or copy serve to download it, right? I get it. Um, but it's like, come on, man. Like none of the developers who worked in those games ever saw a dime off of that crap. You know, it, it just, it, that still missed me to this day, but you know, I'm happy to, you know, thanks to good old game, good old games.com. I'm still getting paid off of jazz. So that's pretty cool. Once in a while I'll, uh, I'll fire it up. And, uh, you know, I feel like I'm like, you know, visiting with an old friend yeah. and I look, I look at like, you know, it's so funny because you look at jazz too. Like I was developing that at the same time as the first unreal, like I was working 16 hours a day and happy to do it, you know, and there's a certain mentality in the game development industry where it's like the monks in a Monty Python movie where they're self-flagellating, like, you know, right. Like, like they, they, they love to uh, you know, try and outwork each other. You know, I've been in studios where, you know, there's this weird like tension where the first person to leave gets this kind of like mm -hmm. vibe, like Ugh. he's probably going home to his fucking wife and kids, you know, like, yeah. Uh, you know, like you got to maintain your family for fuck's sake. You know, I, I learned over the years working in the industry that, you know, especially being a manager myself, um, that I would rather have somebody who comes in and puts in a good seven or eight hours and gets their shit done and gets the fuck out as opposed to somebody who fucks around online for 14 hours, you know? So it's a, the rabbit hole of this business is very, very deep. Um, I've seen a lot in the industry. I've seen, uh, you know, mental health issues. I've seen addiction issues. I've seen uh, affairs. I've seen, you know, families shattered. Um, you know, the thing that people don't realize on online, uh, where they, they're complaining about, you know, this weapon's overpowered, David, uh, the designer of you know, Von Dehar or whatever, Call of Duty guy, fuck you, I'm going to come kill your family. It's like, you know, these these games are made by people. You know, they're made by living, breathing human beings with feelings, you know, and, you know, it's so easy to stand behind a monitor and sling bullshit at somebody, you know, and, you know, the thing to understand is that if you have haters, you're doing something right. But, you know, there's a reason why they say don't read the comments. It's also why, you know, some people don't decide to put themselves out there. I remember at some point, uh, I think it's Rockstar who have, you know, they have their credits with all the, the developers and so on. But it's it's really hard to to figure out who made what in a specific Rockstar game because they they prefer to put their brand out there like this is a Rockstar games game it's not a game by this person or that person uh, also kind of to avoid these things. Uh, well, there, there's a reason for that. So I have a, a theory about that. Like I call it the uh, the the Blue Man Group theory, and the fact that Blue Man Group is genius because you don't know who's in Blue Man Group. And if, you know, whoever owns or runs Blue Man Group, if somebody fucks up, they can just plop whoever out and shave somebody else and paint them blue. So the industry, more than ever, has moved towards a mentality of not wanting to have a Rockstar game designer. And that's the irony of Rockstar, as much as I respect the Housers for what they've done in every GTA game and every game they do is insane. Um, but 
the industry wants, for lack of a better term, uh, their, their employees to be interchangeable cogs. And so the way that it works with an intellectual property, like, for example, David Jaffe made God of War. And it's like opening a restaurant and you're the mm -hmm. chef. And once you have the recipe of the formula, you can fire the chef and bring in a new chef. And maybe the menu is 80 percent is good, but you have the special sauce. Right. And so, you know, then you can just take, you know, control C, control V, control like. But cracking that initial puzzle is the hardest part. And that's, you know, one of the issues with, you know, the guys, uh, Jason West and Vince Sapanella, who made Call of Duty. You know, they made this amazing franchise. And then Activision's like, yeah, fuck you, you know, and, or, and then so that went, you know, in spiral. But they're still using the formula and then somebody else adopts the formula and then they annualize it and it becomes a thing. So that's why I've always been a believer of, you know, developers being advocates, mm -hmm. you know, like the, the, the rock star game designer, I truly believe is a dying breed uh, because the Internet is toxic. Uh, developers don't want to be known and their employers don't want them to be known. And, you know, it's 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 a funny thing because, you know, I I try to leverage my infamy, you know, before I left Epic to, you know, get more out of them. And uh, I think they learned that lesson because anytime you see anything out of them, it's always signed by the team, you know, which seems seems like a, f a warm, fuzzy um, kind of thing. Um, but it's, you know, I suspect it's because they don't want people trying to leverage their infamy or their fame. You know, I think yeah. Kojima-san uh, is one of the last uh, great, uh, you know, uh, rock star developers that, that are out there. Yeah. I think that what's – one thing that actually Dave does really well, Ashri, is he kind of makes you feel connected to the developer of each one of his games. And – and I always like that, and I think that that's an interesting thing uh, that separates what you're talking about from kind of what we're doing here is that when people feel like they have a personal connection with the person who made that game, they're generally a lot more measured with their words. They actually care about it, you know, or they're a piece of shit and they want to attack them personally, but it's easier to weed that out. Whereas uh, when you're talking about these bigger studios, things like Rockstar or you know, Bethesda, when you're just shouting at a brand and you're making an accusation, about like I don't like this. Fuck you! I want to burn the whole you know shoot up the you know the whole building. Screw all you people. When people say stuff like that, they're not thinking of an individual. They're not making a human connection. So yeah, they're thinking yeah. they're they're attacking the entity, yeah. right? And you know one of the main forums we used to uh, look at uh, back in the day was uh, NeoGaf. Um, and years ago, I tweeted NeoGaf. Uh, no one likes you. You're a bunch of cunts. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's not that they are, but I, I remember sitting there watching like, you know, you know, video game artists are a very sensitive bunch. Yeah. And I remember like catching my artists that were working with me at Epic, uh, on NeoGAF and just like stressing about it because the internet is an echo chamber that inev inevitably turns into people overanalyzing things or, you know, Godwin's law, which says every argument turns into somebody invoking Hitler. Um, and it's just... Uh, you know, social media, you know, has only added more, uh, you know, fuel to the fire of it all. And, you know, it's one of the things I did recently was I actually stopped uh, paying attention to how many followers I had on any social media platform. I'm just like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to be me, you know, take me or leave me, you know, um, you know, I'm, I, I've largely moved on from the industry, but I'm still, you know, writing the memoir, you know, producing Broadway shows, which sadly are shut down for now. And I think about, you know, the starving artists who, you know, are on Broadway and, my heart goes out to them. Um, but, you know, my thing these days is uh, learning other businesses, other industries, you know, learning how real estate works, learning how uh, Broadway works, how, what it takes to capitalize a Broadway show, um, you know, after seeing the finances of what it takes to make a video game. Because, you know, Tim and Mark, rightfully at Epic, they were, um, you know, they kept the, you know, those cards close to their chest as any manager who's smart needs to do. Um, but, you know, now seeing, you know, like how the restaurant industry works, you know, to know when, you know, when the coffers are full with the restaurant, when you can have a distribution to, you know, pay attention to complaints, to pay attention to your clientele, uh, just all that stuff. You know, I find it utterly fascinating and it ties into video games because one of the things that I realized about games in general uh, was many, many years ago, you know, I went to New York City for the first time uh, on a business trip during uh, the first Unreal time frame with GT Interactive. And uh, I remember being terrified of New York because I had been trained through TV and movies that New York was a hellhole. This is pre-Giuliani, and the New York was still a little bit shitty. I'm, I'm dating myself right now. Um, and I was terrified of it. And years later, when I returned, I saw it seems like chaos, but there's actually order in it all, from the taxis to the, the buildings to the trash pickup to the restaurants to the deliveries to everything. 
and that's one thing about you know uh, gamers they, they they you know they get unplugged from the matrix after they plug they plug into it and they start to actually see these systems and then they start to unravel them and then once you've w worked in the other side of the fence you see how these systems work and you're like oh they're just trying to make you play longer i know what they're doing right there god damn it you know there's so many times where my wife is still a diehard gamer and with all the games she plays i'm like okay let's go downstairs and let's let's watch netflix and chill and she's like i'm almost done i'm almost off i'm almost off just one more thing and i'm like it's like come on man <laughs> you know like tyrone biggins from fucking yeah y'all you know, got any more of them uh, world of warcraft man <laughs> I was actually just wondering, uh, Cliff, how um, how did it feel to be part of of the early beginnings of the uh, the 3D shooter days? Like you you were part of the Unreal team from you know very 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 young, and you worked on on one of the first 3D shooters. Like it, basically, you worked on levels that helped define an entire genre, the most popular genre in the games industry right now. I got. What what were these days feel like? Did you did you want walk in blindly and you know did you just well, make something that felt cool? My career has largely been driven by envy and insecurity. So the thing is, is you know I remember seeing like images uh, in Wired magazine of this long haired dude John Romero and he, him and his Ferrari and his mansion and you know it went from like you know fuck that guy you know and then I was like oh, I want to be him and then I was like oh, now I want to beat him. You know, and the thing was, is, you know, I was never that good of an artist or that good of a coder, but I played every video game known to man up to that point, and I could speak the language. Uh, and I always say I was never cool enough for the cool kids, never nerdy enough for the nerds. Um, and then, you know, uh, we were basically, you know, wanting to take down id. That was our number one goal. And, you know, of course, we wanted to make money, and make great games, but it's like id were the rock stars uh, of the uh, and the darlings of the business. And I remember when the Quake test came out. Uh, and I remember, you know, trying to fluff up mentally the not literally because uh, the uh, employees, uh, you know, contractors, you know, that at Epic at the time, like saying it's not that good. You know, we had colored lighting, we had higher resolution textures and the characters and the environment. Um, you know, and we we it took three and a half years of basically living in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, which is a shitty little college town. No offense to Waterloo, but you suck. Um, and basically, like you just working our butts off 16 hours a day and you know i had to adapt from making 2d adventure games when i was a teenager uh using using visual basic uh to you know learning how to make a platformer game with jazz jackrabbit to then making the the leap to 3d i'll, I'll never forget you know being in a i visited my uh, producer and musician for jazz uh, robert allen's place he was living in literally a trailer in tuolumne california uh, editing levels, and he uh, he had downloaded the first version of the editor that Tim had been working on, and he, uh, I looked over the screen. I was like, "What was that?" He's like, "This is this is going to change everything. This is going to be big." And you know that was part of the genesis of what became the Unreal Engine. But you know, Tim once again realized that take people who are creative, uh, who may not necessarily be that technical, because the person who's creative and technical is a rare breed, but all but like make better tools. And, you know, so Unreal had this thing called constructive solid geometry back in the day where the imagine the world's entirely filled with concrete and you, you have the various primitive bores that you can bore into it and carve carve things out of it. Um, and I took to that like a fish to water. Uh, my levels weren't the best, but one thing that I had a, was a pretty good sense of pacing. Um, you know, I'd watched every movie that you could find. And, uh, you know, so and I knew that when it came to introducing monsters in a video game you didn't want them to just burst out like a jump scare you wanted to tease them almost like a strip tease so if you go back to the first unreal uh with the the iconic predator like scar enemy mm -hmm. um you know i you saw like a tail you heard a growl you heard them messing somebody up behind a door uh you know you saw like a shadowy figure running away and then eventually you know i locked you in a hallway and started shutting off all the lights yeah. and then i actually did it like a monster closet i know it's a cliche now um then you know the red lights were flashing and techno music was blaring and people were shitting their pants uh and you know that's one of the things i learned from alien uh and even you know the lights turning off was taken from the, the old 1990s movie uh, event horizon um so you know i I'd, I'd read every issue of the me the magazine uh, entertainment weekly since i was like since like 1990 i stopped when i turned like 38 or whatever but because it's just like why am i reading this shit you know just go, go online um, but yeah, it's uh, it was a really, really seminal time for the industry. 
Um, and the multiplayer for Unreal launched Broken, uh, which, you know, it, it really, like, put the fear of God into us because multiplayer gaming Quake World was coming online. Um, and that's when we doubled down. We were looking to do uh, what we were calling the bot pack because we had the first uh, autonomous AI that uh, had been coded for Quake as a mod by a guy named Steve Polge, who I believe is still at Epic. He's a good dude. Um, and uh, and so we we're going to make just a pack that didn't have to be played online because not everybody had the internet back in the 90s. Um, and I made sure it said on the box myself, does not need an internet connection. And uh, Mark Rain had the genius idea of saying, no, we need to make it this its own game. And, you know, there's a lot more to it. But the thing is, is uh, you know, making the transition from 2D to 3D was a, was a really, really interesting one. Because I think if you look at the console space, that was a rough one. Because no offense to PlayStation, most of the PlayStation 1 games kind of fucking sucked. Like, you know, the, the, the graphics were, like, wobbly. Like, Jumping Flash I loved. You know, but Battle Arena to Shinden, eh, Warhawk was okay. You know, the, the 3D was super, super clunky until PlayStation 2. And that's when things really started to, like, gel. Um, but, you know, if you look, you know, I think back about my history, type. Like, you know, when I was your age, there were these magazines, like Die Hard Game Fan. That was essentially the hustler of video game uh, porno type rags, where they would put these almost pornographic high res pixel art images all over every single page. And I would just devour that. And because and, I was never that good of a pixel artist. And to this day, pixel art is still such a wonderful art form. And I catch myself on YouTube going down the chiptune style uh, rabbit hole of listening to old school video game soundtracks. It's, it was such an art form. You know, like Revenge of Shinobi still has one of the greatest video game soundtracks of all time. Streets of Rage. Like, and, you know, it's funny because I downloaded an emulator for the Sega Genesis because um, my wife was too young for it at, at the time um, when it came out. And uh, she's play she's like, are these all just like, you know, top down or sideways shooters or beat em ups? I'm like, yeah, maybe occasionally a puzzle game like Columns. But yeah, I guess that's pretty much the formula. But we had Sonic, which the movie wasn't bad, by the way. I enjoyed it. I had a really good time. Oh yeah, we, we we saw that actually a couple of weeks ago. That was that was pretty pretty damn fun. I want to dig into this thing. You said this a few times that you you believe we live in the matrix and I'm I'm very interested in the psychology of someone who's spent their whole life as you know, until recently creating digital worlds who believes that this is a digital world because I feel like you have some insight or some evidence that perhaps the rest of us don't have. <laughs> well, I, I had a chapter in my book that, uh, you know, I, um, I, I, I've gotten rid of, but I'm gonna, I want to weave it through it as a theme of, like, how working in video games can drive you slightly insane, right? And, you know, when you've worked with programmers and, and, and systems like that for 25 years, you start to see patterns. You know, I think the Wachowskis, um, sisters now, uh, were onto something. Um, and, I, you know, you see these little things in the world where, like, you know, I'm not even talking about, like, is your phone listening to you? You know, Lauren and I will, like, randomly talk about a friend we haven't talked about in forever. And then the next day they'll call us. You know, and our phones aren't even anywhere near us, mm -hmm. right? Like, and it's like there's this these little things like, you know, I, you know, I'm fortunate to have a big house on a big lot. and But, you know, I still have to manually check the old school snail mail, right? our neighborhood's like a big neighborhood, you know, like, but there's not a lot of like main street traffic outside of it. I go to walk to our mailbox and 99% of the time, the second I get to the mailbox, a car goes by and it bothers me because I'm not a neighborly motherfucker. I don't want to wave and you know, uh, it's good. I don't even fucking know you. Right. But like it, I, you start to see trends like that throughout the world and it starts to like make you trip a little bit. And, you know, it's like I'm not even a big stoner or do like, you know, psychedelics. But, you know, once you peel back, you know, the code of the Matrix and the phrase that I like to say is at 30, they unplug you from the Matrix. At 40, you see the code and then your body goes, ha ha, fuck you, you know. So it's, uh, you know, the thing about the Housers and Grand Theft Auto, you know, I, I, I don't think they're from the States. I think they're Brits, if I recall. Um you know, like when you play like uh, GTA San Andreas, or you know, like uh, the ones that take place in the fictional Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and you know, you realize the depiction they did of Los Angeles. You realize you, you, the things you hear from people walking past you, you know, and then you start seeing that in the real world. It's like th there's there's some weird overlap there, you know. Like I literally tell my therapist 
that you know the matrix god is sending me signals occasionally you know and uh it's uh i don't know you know i think you know if you look at the way technology is increasing you look at deep fakes you i feel like i'm on the joe rogan podcast right now by the way um <laughs> you look at deep fakes you look at you know how we're, we're about to you know continue to cross the uncanny valley um i don't think it's i don't think it's out of the question I really think, you know, like that's that's so here to, to further go down the Alex Jones rabbit hole. I think most conspiracy theories are bullshit. But if you think we're actually in the Matrix, they might actually make sense. So mm. and then I just did that whole like that animated gif of that lady with, you know, looking confused with all the like, you know, like geometry around her and everything like that. But yeah, um, you know, and the, the other thing about working in video games for so long is one of the main things about my job was to play spot the difference. You know, uh, there's a, a magazine called Highlights for Children that I read when I was a kid where it was the classic, like, what's the difference in this and that? Circle it. And, you know, they, they're, they're little kiosks at bars where you can play silly digital versions of that. Yeah. Um, it was my job to do that, uh, amongst many other things when I worked in games. And, you know, I'd like I'd go on like a press junket for Gears and I come back and like the blood would look like 50 percent less uh, coming out of the, the enemies. And, uh, and no one would notice this shit. Or the camera, you know, the over-the-shoulder camera on the main, or on Marcus would be fucked up. And I'm like, how is nobody noticing this shit? To the point where when I had boss key, um, I think our default FOV, field of view, was 90. And, you know, I came in one day and I fired up a new build. And I could sense that it had been shifted to about 80. And I went into one of my programmers, Matt Fishman. I was like, who changed the FOV? And he looked up at me and he's like, you noticed that? And I'm like, dude, this is not my first rodeo, you know, like, and it's the same thing with, you know, aim assist in console games, you know, like there's there Halo, Halo usually does it perfectly, but you know, other games, you know, fuck it up because it's, it's hard to get right. You know, how much do you slow down the, you know, crosshair over the enemy? How much do you do bullets pulling towards them? You know, and when do you pull away? And if, if you're not, you know, actively moving the stick, the, it shouldn't move your camera when the enemy goes over your reticle. You know, you should have to participate in it. Like all these little nuanced things behind the scenes of code. It's really games are the ultimate blend of art and science. And it's a miracle that they ever ship. And the thing that I miss about all the retro games that you guys are, you know, going on about is, you know, is usually like fire and forget. And maybe you do a sequel, you know, like I actually want to go back and play the original Duke Nukem. Cause I remember having a conversation, Fred, with uh, uh, via CompuServe with uh, Scott and George from 3D Realms yeah. about, about how as amazing as Doom was, because Doom was, you know, Doom was straightforward, simple, uh, about, like, you know, wanting to interact with the panels on the walls and wanting to just, you know, do more with, with the environment. Uh, and that's actually one of the reasons why Tom Hall, uh, one of the main creatives behind Doom and Commander Keen, wound up leaving, because he didn't get what he wanted creatively. And so Scott and George found uh, a window there where they can, like, make a world that's super duper interactive and that's one of my things about you know we live in a world now where it's games as service uh you know got to keep the game going keep it updated 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 whether you want it or not and i look at you know playing animal crossing uh, new horizons right now and if N nintendo's brilliant right but if i was running that game I'd, I'd continue to have more cosmetics more things but I, what i would do is i would double down on allowing you to actually play basketball on your little basketball court i would allow you to take the little tricycle that you can put and dr drive it around your island I would allow you to take the little scooters and scoot, uh, and, and then with friends and like you know, my wife made a, like a, a mock laser tag arena, you know, like put that in there because you know, like it's it just keep it going, you know. I, I, I'm I'm assuming they have plans for something like that. You got on the tangent of you know designing digital worlds, and it seems like you just have this mind, like you just like I just saw your brain naturally go on this tangent of like how can I design this already existing digital world to make it better and everything. And it just it just really interests me. I think that's a window into your psychology that is, I think it's interesting and it's something that we need to. Well, it's it. it's, it's cool. I it, it's actually been a challenge for my marriage. Yeah. Like I'm an incredibly incredibly happily married guy, uh, and my wife has the patience of Job, as they say. But like you know, if if she moves any of my shit, like I know it's been moved. Yeah. Like it, it's it, and and then like you know we're like you know we're we're well off. You know we're in love, but when you're happy in a relationship, like the little shit especially during a pandemic gets escalated. Like you can't believe you left your pants on the floor, woman, you know, kind of stuff. Um, but also like, you know, I know when like, you know, somebody has, you know, been outside in my yard or whatever. Like I, I just, I'm trained that way to spot the most subtle little difference. Um, because, you know, 
back when we were working on Unreal, um, we had this issue where, you know, the binary space partitioning, the BSP, that was used to kind of help, you know, compile the world and form it, would occasionally glitch out. And it would cause these little mirrored window holes. And uh, there's so many parts of the first Unreal where we just covered it up with like a little like mesh, like put a rock over it or uh, like a, a, a fern or some shit. Because uh, if you the collision on those was often fucked and you'd wind up falling through the world. And the same thing actually continued through Unreal Tournament where we put these uh, kill Z planes where, yeah, God forbid, the player actually like, you know, accidentally found one of these holes and fell through the world. We'd make sure they died and didn't wind up just sitting at the bottom of the map and not knowing what to do with themselves. So it's... um. You know, it's it's seeing systems, and that's the thing that gamers see. And that's one thing, you know, the, the older generation is afraid of, you know, screen time. They're afraid of games. And it's so cute to see my wife's uh, niece's nephew. Uh, nephew's going to be, like, what, eight now? And to see, to visit his Animal Crossing island, and to see, like, him unraveling these systems. Mm-hmm. And there's the old saying that, you know, uh, you know, movies and TV are lean-back experiences, whereas games are the lean-forward experience. And, you know, there's so much fear about what games do and as jaded as I can be, uh, it's, it's good for the brain. You know, it's, it's, it's good to, to, you know, get, there's the idea of flow, you know, and like I go back to all the way back to Tetris and Tetris is still one of the greatest games of all time because I can still play Tetris and what's happening in the back of my brain is I'm actually compiling things that, problems that I'm solving in my own life, you know, my, you know, things that stress me out. It's relaxing you know, putting these stupid little puzzle blocks together. And there's a reason why I wound up being so addictive. You know, it's the same thing with sleep. You know, I think during the day, your brain is essentially writing code. Uh, and at night, you know, if you need to get a good night's sleep so your brain can compile that code. And kind of that's what dreams are. Dreams are kind of a manifestation of that, right? I, I'm going full like Timothy Leary on you right now. So you might not even know who that is, but yeah. I do, but it's fine. Okay. I think it... I think this is cool. This is what this show is not. This show is not meant to just be about like let's talk about game stuff. Like you, you can talk about whatever you want. That we're we're trying to show an insight into the great minds of this industry. That's sort of my goal. Like not just you could be some brand new independent guy, someone who just did like a really cool mod for something. Speaking of, have you played Jazz Jackrabbit Doom or have you seen this? Oh, I saw a video of it. Yeah, it's so <laughs> good. I mean, like actually a really good Doom mod, but. My standards, anyway. Like I played all the way through it. It's really good level design, and just I, I love everything about it. But I think that I'll might actually, actually let be, me make a note. That might be part of your sales. Like I think that actually brought Jazz Jack Rabbit into the minds of a lot of people because Icarus Lives uh, did a really great review of Jazz Jack Rabbit Doom, and then I played it, and a bunch of other people played it and have been talking about it. And probably well, here's the funny thing is that uh, you know, I'll, like I said, I just made a note. I'll download it after this. Um, it's it's like so meta that like we, I was chasing it for so many years and you know Carmack was so brilliant to allow people to mod the game mm-hmm. and then like it's like the Ouroboros where like now the game that I worked so hard on is in the game I was trying to beat um, but uh, where was I going with this uh, Jazz uh, Doom I uh, lost my train of thought again um, you're you're chasing it and then the- oh yeah yeah so yeah. The, the whole point I wanted to make is um it really confounds people right now that um, you know, I've gotten involved with uh, the, uh, the the Great White Way, Broadway, right? Because mm-hmm. um, I've been a Broadway fan for since I was 15. My father died when I was 15, and my mother, as her therapy, listened to Phantom of the Opera. Um, and it, you know, it still actually largely holds up, even though you know the Phantom was probably an incel. Um, and then you know, I got hooked on Rent, and then Les Misérables, and 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 uh, all these kind of all these kinds of musicals. And uh, this guy who's a fan of mine, uh, he's a Broadway star named Alex Boinello. He was in Spring Awakening. He was in Dear Evan Hansen. Um, he roped me into, you know, investing in co-producing shows. Um, and I realized, you know, there's a reason why, uh, you know, I was drawn to Broadway because there's actually a lot of overlap between how a Broadway show works and how video games work. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I always I said earlier that it's a miracle that a video game ever ships it's a miracle that a Broadway show ever happens, especially ones with crazy production values. Uh, you think about, you know, like the, the people have to be able to, to, to dance, to sing, to act, uh, you know, uh, eight times a week. You know, uh, the the lighting has to be on cue. The music has, the live orchestra has to be on cue. Uh, you know, the props need to be in the right place. Uh, in, in Miss Saigon, the chopper needs to work and come down at the end of act one. You know, everything needs to come together. You know, in, in, in Manhattan, like the standards for this kind of stuff are crazy. And, you know, 
um, I recently, uh, before the shutdown, of course, um, donated to the uh, NC Theater uh, Conservatory. Um, they did a local production of Kinky Boots, uh, which is an amazing story. It's a true story. You can Google it. Um, turned out fantastic, but they needed um, these treadmills to, to put the boots on in the factory. And, uh, you know, I was able to facilitate that. And I brought the governor of North Carolina and his family to the show because I, you know, I know the governor, blah, 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 weird flex, but OK. Um, but the whole thing is like if you look at the amount of different interlocking pieces, again, gears, for lack of a better term, uh, for a video game to ship and operate as well as a Broadway show, it's crazy. And, you know, I was talking to Fred also earlier to segue into the whole Twitch thing. You know, almost every Twitch streamer I know is depressed. And the thing is, is like, you know, I know a, a decent amount of Broadway stars now in this day and age, and they all seem pretty well adjusted, apart from the pandemic, of course. Um, but, you know, they have to be on. Each show is usually about two and a half hours, uh, eight times a week. If they're sick or they have some place to be, they have an understudy for it. These streamers have to be on like se six to seven days a week, six to eight hours a day. Well, everybody in the chat is is trolling them and kappa, kappa, kappa and all that shit, right? Um, and it's even worse if you're a female. Like, the, the most depressed streamers I know are female because mm. it's grill, 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 show your tits, show your tits. You look tired or you look hot. I want to fuck you. You know, there's just so much of technology in the internet was just driven by thirsty dudes. Mm. You know, the, the rise of Instagram butt models. Um, <laughs> do you know uh, Jessica Negri, by the way? Oh, yeah. She, she was kind of the, the first one that really – broke through this whole, you know, being a gamer and yeah. She, she broke the mold, man. You know, she's, yeah. she, she, we, uh, at every uh, year when a comic con happens, uh, the last like three, four years, uh, Justin Roiland from uh, Rick and Morty and Alex Hirsch from gravity falls. And I, we all throw what we call the big dumb yacht party. And, uh, she comes to the party. Um, and, uh, we all just go get totally swifty. And, uh, it's my, how, how do you do fellow kids? And uh, she's a total sweetheart. And every year we get a photo where, like, she's grabbing Lauren's boobs. And it's just, like, become, like, a thing. But on her Instagram, whenever she posts a photo and you can see her butt, I always comment, butt, butt, or, like, some, you know, mission control, we have a butt. And uh, and people always reply, like, simp. Or they, like, tag my wife. Like, you know, she's, like, like, like they're trying to bust me. I'm like, dude, oh, my, wife, my, wife <laughs> likes, my wife likes butts, too. We're friends with Jess. And Jess has grabbed my wife's boobs. Like, what the fuck? But... Yeah. So the thing about, you know, social media may may unite and save us or it may be the very destruction of humanity. And it's just so funny that, you know, the idea of an influencer. Have you guys seen uh, the Instagram uh, influencers in the wild? I don't think so. No, what's this? Oh, uh, yeah. It's the one where other people take photos of influencers trying to make their perfect photos, right? Yeah. Video, yeah. right? Cause, yeah, you know, it's hilarious. I, my wife and I went to Vieques a few years ago and, uh, I remember watching, like, my wife was, like, seeing this woman on the beach, beautiful woman in a bikini, whatever, um, and she had this, like, this professional photographer with, like, the hardcore camera and everything like that, like, take, like, 30 minutes, like, to try to get this, like, spontaneous shot, and Lauren's like, I'm going to find out who this girl is, and she's, like, checking, like, hashtag Vegas, blah, 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 like, all that stuff, right? The next day, it popped up, and the girl posted it on her gram, and it was like, oh, just hanging out at the beach, <laughs> like, and it's just, like, Social media in so many ways is fucking horseshit and a lie. And, you know, it's like, and I say this as somebody who owns a decent amount of Facebook stock because I invested in fucking Oculus, which was the greatest investment of my entire life. Um, and that's not a flex. It's just the truth. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, it's just amazing. Like, it, it, you know, what I, what I like to do in my feed is try to make people laugh on Twitter or promote other developers, uh, especially indie ones. Uh, you know, use your platform, as they say. Um, and then on Instagram, you know, I just post like, you know, goofy shit, you know, and if you get all the engagement you do and, you know, the key about social media, you know, unless you're trying to monetize it, and make a living out of it is the only way to win is to not really give a shit, you know, and like I look at uh, um, uh, Corey Balrog um, uh, from God of War and he's he's mastered the game of engagement on Twitter like he's a total troll. And, like, the internet is, like, I have my friends who work at uh, Justin Roiland Studio Squanch Games, and they are just steeped in meme culture nonstop. And I go back and forth with meme culture, where I'm like, oh, this is such trash. And then I'm like, okay, that's, that's a pretty funny one. And then sometimes you get sucked down the meme rabbit hole. And, you know, to segue into politics, you know, I am a, a registered Democrat. 
I'm not a fan of 45. I think he's uh, actually going insane. Um, but, you know, uh, I donated to Hillary's campaign. Hillary's far from perfect. Um, but I remember seeing how, you know, the memes were coming out about, you know, Trump and, you know, deplorables and things like that. And you realize that, you know, we live in a world where, you know, it's not just enough to buy campaign ads. You know, each side, due to social media and memes, has to be increasingly savage, for better or for worse. You know, you even look at, like, fast food restaurants. Like, was it Wendy's on Twitter? Like, yeah, they, they always have these, uh, you know, where they tweet at each other and, hey, Wendy's, are you okay? And then McDonald's comes in, hey, how can we help? And, you know... Burger King is depressed and so on. It's, it's, it's kind of hilarious, but it's also a it, genius marketing tactic. It really is because all that matters is eyeballs. Yeah. yeah. And the same thing goes back to esports. Um, one of the things I wrote about in my uh, book was uh, in 2001. Um, Ty, were you even born then? 2001? Go yeah. On. Yeah, I was born in two. So, yeah, um, you know, I went to the World Cyber Games, the first World Cyber Games in Korea. And I remember kind of giggling at how serious they were taking that shit. You know, they had like a, a Olympics-style ceremony where they all came, like, trotted out flags from each country. Um, you know, the, the stakes were high. And I was sitting here going, like, this is kind of – I can't tell if this is cool or stupid. And, you know, going to Dallas to see the CPL. Fred, do you remember the CPL? Yep. Yep. doesn't Angel, exist anymore, does it? I don't know, man. Angel Munoz, man. Poor dude lost his son in, a, like, a jet ski accident. It's fucked up. Um you know, and seeing fatality being filmed for an MTV special, you know, Jonathan Wendell, you know, he and Thresh were two of the first pro gamers, right? And yeah. Jonathan, yeah. John, Jonathan's a smart dude. He made his his own brand into like selling video cards and things like that. Uh, I still he, sound like a, you know, a dumb dumb. Whenever, whenever someone talks about pro Quake players, the only one I really know is fatality. And apparently, like for me, he's like the Tony Hawk of, you know. He, re pro he, really, he really is. Yeah. Um, and then he, he built a brand and he leveraged it. Yeah. And, uh, um, but yeah, the whole thing about esports, you know, like to look at, you know, I, I'll never forget, you know, uh, you know, when I was at Epic, uh, there's before I left, there was a lot of League of Legends envy, um, you know, people like, you know, who saw how like League of Legends could fill the Staples Center, and uh, you know, there's there's games that I get, and there's games that I don't get. Not literally, I'm just saying understand, um, you know, like I, I I never got MOBAs, I I I played Smite. You know, I, I liked the over-the-shoulder view. I think Epic was onto something with Paragon, but it didn't get traction. Um, and so they pulled the plug on that one. But, like, you know, there's this uh, amazing SNL sketch with uh, Chance the Rapper. Uh, every time he's on SNL, you should look it up because he's, his comedic timing is fucking awesome. Um, where he, he, he played, like, a sports announcer in prior sketches. And then they have a thing where he was essentially kind of re, uh, re instate re, uh, like re reassign, I guess is the word, to be an esports an uh, uh, announcer, and he like he doesn't know what League of Legends like is, and he's like sitting there like with the mic going like, I don't know what's going on behind me, but this looks like <laughs> what I think a seizure feels like, and then they bring in this like this chubby Asian kid um, who like won the tournament, mm -hmm. and he's like they do the super awkward interview, and then all of a sudden all these like you know like six like hot girls come in, and they're like oh my god, they're like can we go backstage with you? And he's like sure. And Chance is like, we're officially in the upside down. And I'll never forget, like, you know, uh, also during uh, uh, Lawbreakers, uh, we went to New Orleans, uh, obviously to visit family because my wife's family is from there, amazing city. Um, but to visit one of those kind of pro gaming tournaments, just to kind of see what it was all about. And I remember sitting there, seeing this, like, kind of awkward dude playing, like, with two pretty girls just hanging on him. And we're, we're in the world where pro gamers are making fuck tons of money. And they have fucking groupies. Like, they're the new rock stars, you know? And, I mean, more power to them. But the thing is, it's, it's a lot like the NFL, whereas there's a shelf life. Because when it comes to reaction times, it comes to wit, it comes to, you know, on camera and things like that. Like, once you're past, like, 25, like, good luck. Like, you know, it's, it's funny because you think about pro gaming, if they were smart, well, they are smart, but if they were smarter, I would, what I would do is I'd do it just like the Nintendo World Championships back in the day. I'd have age brackets. You know, I was in the like, you know, 12 to 15 to 16 year old age bracket. There's an older bracket. And then there's like the kid bracket. Right. Um, you know, to just keep more eyeballs and, you know, people want to be aspirational. So maybe there is some, you know, 35 year old dude who loves his games, who's in a shitty marriage, who wants to aspire to be the next pro gamer. You know, maybe he could find, you know, a slot for that so he could actually do something like that, you know. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, we, I think we have we have something a, a bit like that. I, I think it's uh, it's spawned from this whole uh, esports trend with uh, with Counter Strike, which is undoubtedly the, you know, the biggest esport currently. Um, I recently discovered something called uh, Company CS, which is an organization uh, in Denmark that takes different companies, like a law firm, an accountant firm, and you know, a hair saloon and a restaurant and so on, and then they sign these companies up to play in leagues against each other. So it's all amateurs. Not like yeah. many of them have never played the games before. And then they're in their own league. So it's like, oh, the the uh, you know the the accountant uh, you know at, at the corner uh, against the uh, you know the food truck guys on the other corner, and and they're playing against each other. And then they like climb the ranks in this league, and it's hilarious because it's all dads and boomers playing these games. Yeah, well, it's 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 the same thing, uh, you know, kind of like uh, people who do like amateur kickball leagues. Yeah, you know, like uh, it's it's you know, games, games can divide us, but they can also unite us. And it's one of those things that I look at what's going on with the shutdown and the pandemic. Um, and games are an escape, you know, and and they're you know, yeah, you get you know people online using racial slurs and being you know misogynistic and shit. You know, I get that. Um, you know, it's one of the biggest mistakes that Microsoft made back in the day was leaving voice on by default um, and not opt in. Like Nintendo was really smart about that because Nintendo knows they have so many young fans. Um, but yeah, it's uh, one of those things that uh, you know, it's all it, it ties into like a good part what you what you just said, Fred, of the tribal nature of humanity. Mm-hmm. You know, us yeah. versus them. You know, like ah, uh, you know, our plumbing shop's gonna defeat your bar staff. You know, um, and you know. Uh, rising tide raises all boats you know when i opened uh you know the beer garden in raleigh before again the fucking pandemic um you know one of the other bar owners you know came up to me and he's like we're up like 30 percent, man thanks i'm like you know it takes a village you know in business and in games uh you know things to you know try to find things that unite us instead of dividing us you know and like we've, we've seen more division in the states than ever and, you know, somebody had tweeted me. They said, what, you know, what could, like, you know, unite us during these fucked up times? And I'm like, games. Yeah. You know, if you're arguing about the weapon balance of a game, you know, that's that's good. You know, you're not punching each other, in the, you know, in the face and at a bar, you know. So, um, you know, as somebody who, you know, has had, you know, the epiphany that you can't please everybody. You know, there's always going to be somebody who, you know, thinks, uh, you know, your work is shit. Um, but if you have a good fan base and your work is selling. You know, and that's the irony of, uh, you know, you know, my, my studio cratering, which for the record nearly broke me, broke my fucking heart, um, is the fact that I still get people tweeting me either like, I miss Lawbreakers. And I'm like, well, where the fuck were you? You know, or, uh, you know, I miss Radical Heights, you know, the little yeah. uh, battle royale that we cobbled together, which is not exactly the game I wanted it to be. But at that point, I'd lost control of the studio. Um, but yeah, that's neither here nor there. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just like, you know, or the, or people love to troll me and like, you know, because one thing, Ty, that I appreciate you being younger in, is people just know me for just gears yeah. or, you know, it's, it's this like this. I have a, a, a rule in the industry that I call it the 10 to 15 year rule. And what you can do with game mechanics and IP is like or even movies is relaunch something or re- reintroduce a feature that came out years ago that uh, the, cur- the current generation won't remember. Like, you know, a, a six year old isn't going to re- play unreal tournament back in the day but when they eventually get around to call of duty and they, they implement a double jump it's gonna be like you know well this is so innovative and you know people don't know like that's why you know on my personal twitter page you know what i have pinned right there for anybody who follows me new is my moby games list people don't know that i worked on unreal 2 i worked on rune i uh, worked on bullet storm mm. uh, i worked on shadow complex i worked on an infinity blade like all this stuff, like I was, you know, a Swiss army knife working at Epic to continue to prove myself to Tim. Um, and I, I got my fingers in as many pies as I could. I helped sell the engine. I, you know, I, I helped sell the engine to Ubisoft for Splinter Cell back in the day. And, you know, to the point where, you know, it's, you know, I, I got a good enough salary that I could install a jacuzzi at my house during my first shitty marriage. And I called it my Splinter Cell jacuzzi jokingly to my friends at conferences, right? Like, you know, I I was involved in a lot of stuff, and what people like to do online is try and find that one recent failure and just dig in, yeah. you know. And it, it's I try to ignore it, but on, the thing that bothers me is if they were throwing Unreal Two in my face, fine, you know, it was it was actually remembered as a pretty good game, but it didn't do that well. 
Um, you know, other games that I worked on, like I made that adventure game way back in the day, Dare to Dream, Dare to Dream, which was all over the fucking board, um, and totally fucking tanked. Um, but the, the thing about Lawbreakers was, you know, I saw it as me being the Phoenix, you know, Marcus Phoenix, blah, 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 of returning to the business. And we put our hearts and our souls into that. And Overwatch is a good game, right? You know, they, they leveraged the Blizzard and Activision marketing. Um, they leveraged the fact that, you know, weeb culture is huge. You know, the fact you go to you go to fucking Pornhub and, like, it's like the amount of, like, Overwatch porn exploded, you know, and then, like, you know, that, you know, I always say, look to the east to see what's going to be big in the west right. from technology and culture and things like that. You know, Japanese horror wound up, you know, kind of being mimicked in, in, in the States, you know, smartphone culture, smartphone games, farming games, all that shit, you know, and then anime. You know, you have an entire generation that just loves anime. My wife has an entire shelf of those, like, sexy, like, you know, anime girls with the big boobs and the tiny bikinis. You know, I, I, I joke, you know, this fall on Fox, so I married a weeb, you know, and, and Blizzard was smart to leverage that. The thing that gets me about Overwatch is some of the core mechanics are weird. Like, the auto-aim on PC, you know, like Hanzo's arrow, it's just like a giant fucking beach ball, you know, things like that. That's that's what bothered me, because I was trying to make a core shooter, but that was actually one of the flaws with Lawbreakers, was it was too core, and our matchmaking wasn't that good, so people who'd been in the, in the 8 million alphas and betas that we'd done would just decimate anybody new because we didn't do the exact same thing of, you know, Team Fortress 2 of Overwatch. We had different abilities, but then we got lumped into being a clone. So it's just like, you know, I'm looking forward to kind of, you know, analyzing, you know, why the game failed and why the studio failed. Marketing was also an issue. Um, it's a multifaceted thing. Um, well, the game the game itself was fantastic. And, and I think even if, you know, if, if it had come out today or maybe in, in a couple of years from now, um, when when games like Overwatch and Fortnite has kind of lost its shine, you know, at some point people will be looking at a game like this. It's the same reason that you know when when Quake Champions came out, it kind of tried to do a lot of the same things, and you know it's kept alive because you know there is a lot of money behind keeping a game like that alive. But it's it's nowhere nearly as po po popular as it should have been. Um, but it's not a bad game at all. I just think there's a right timing for a game like that, and at some point I think all these these people who love a game like Overwatch and love a game like like Fortnite, at some point they're gonna want something different, and then they realize, uh, maybe a bit too late, that a game like Overwatch was very different in many aspects, and a game like Quake Champions is very different. But then at, at that point, it's just too late, and then there'll be something else that they'll, you know, sink their teeth into. I was just saying one of the things about this industry, as you, you alluded to, Fred, is timing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, timing is everything, and also, you know, one of the things I learned from my partner in the in the restaurants. Uh, is find an emerging market and ride it up. You know, when, when it came back to jazz, I didn't see a lot of character action platformers on the PC. And then I lucked into finding this uh, amazing Dutch programmer that was obsessed with frame rate uh, in 256 colors where we wanted to just like defeat Apogee in 3D realms. You know, and the same thing where we looked at, you know, the 3D market where things were going with, uh, you know, Quake and we zigged when they zagged. We made, I just did Trump hands, I'm sorry. Um, we did a uh, you know colored lighting in you know beautiful sky castles as opposed to dark Trent Reznor music infused dungeons and things like yeah. that, right? So, uh, Unrealist I is still an absolutely incredible game. We're, we're a lot of people on, on our team who are gigantic Unreal fans. I, I have a uh, an, an old MS DOS computer right next to me, uh, and, and the awesome. one game the one game that's installed and running on there is uh, Unreal on uh, on a Voodoo Two. SLI setup and it's just incredible. That game takes still takes twenty five hours to play through in single player, and it's just an insane experience. Yeah, um, it's uh, it was a lot of work, man. It uh, it nearly that nearly broke me. You know, I basically started. I was in my uh, I was happy in my relationship from you know the, the woman who had become my first wife at the time, but it was so agonizing to have to first you know go to Waterloo, Ontario, commuting from Ontario, California, ironically, um, Matrix, and to then um essentially like you know spend uh, a week there and then three weeks home then two weeks there two weeks home three weeks in waterloo uh one week home you know three and a half weeks four day four or five days home right like you know it, it just I, yeah it's uh, it was it was tough man you know and and ultimately you know the game did decently um but it was one of those things that you know i was young and i was willing to kill myself to prove myself yeah plus you know there, I wanted to just build this mystery. That's one thing that Unreal had 
was the sense of place, the sense of mystery, yeah. you know, it, it, the large environments, you know, and like, you know, one thing I was talking to my writing partner for the book about is that, uh, you know, we didn't know what the fuck we were making. You know, it was just artists just making random texture sets, level designers just making random environments. And I had to work with everybody to figure out a narrative that would cobble it all together and, you know, came up with the idea that it was the Bermuda Triangle of the galaxy. That's why you had all these alien species together. That's why I had all these crashed spaceships and the evil scar had the ability uh, using the local material Teridium to get off the planet, which was your one goal, right? So and then you know, the, the game changed a lot. Like I, I remember from like ninety five, ninety six. You know, whenever you read about it and saw saw screenshots and so on, the, the game just kept changing and changing. Like, what was the process there? Like, what was it originally going to, to be about? Was it just going to be? It was just play, make a quick like game and then try and differentiate ourselves. You know, there's little little epiphanies that we had where you know, uh, I actually originally wanted there to be a nail gun in uh, Unreal One. Um, and then Quake came out with a nail gun, and I was like, fuck, because, yeah. you know, what I wanted to do is do the thing that Dead Space later did, uh, which was kind of use uh, mining tools more as, like, weapons, yeah. you know, and I had, that, I had that epiphany when I was in Home Depot, when I was uh, there with the digital camera, taking photos of, like, textures of, like, you know, faux marble and, like, faux uh, wood and things like that, you know, linoleum and things like that for the environments, and, uh, you know, the, the, one of the problems with the game that goes on that long it's the same thing with Duke, Nuke, Duke Nukem Forever. Is like you know, it, it starts off strong, and then there's a torque point where the tech gets better, tech gets better, and then you have to go back and reconfigure the old levels to make them look good, and then you know, update the later levels. And uh, it, 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 the game can somehow like kind of implode on itself, and that's you know why I think the multiplayer for the first Unreal was so uh, kind of fucked and broken. Um, you know, it's funny you mentioned Fred. It was like you know, 25 hours to get through. And it's like, I remember like, you know, when we thought we were done, our final QA test was Tim Sweeney ordering me to just play through it one more time. And I think I got through it in six because uh, I knew every nook and cranny. I did, I did uh, Child's Play uh, live stream of, of the game. Uh, God, what was that back in 2014? And after, I think after 20 hours, I was just, I was not done with the game, but I was done. Uh, <laughs> I just couldn't go on. It was just so incredibly long. Uh, it's fantastic, but very, very long. But um, when you're talking about the level design and, and how you go through the technology, one of the benefits that Unreal had was that it was so far ahead technologically um, when the game came out that during its development, I can imagine that you probably didn't have to worry that much about um, some of your early stuff looking outdated. But when did you guys make like the first intro level of Vortex Rikers? Was that at the very end of development? Um, I don't remember, honestly, you know, you're reminding me of, uh, you know, when I would talk to, you know, Todd, my writing partner and like, yeah, I don't know what I was doing in 1996. Um, it's just, uh, it was throw as much shit at the wall and see what stuck. And it's funny that you mentioned, you know, for you, 25 hours of the game, because at some point, you know, we all had to sit down and we realized we had to cut, like we just, the level designers had so much time, you know, because we were just waiting on AI. We were waiting on, uh, art. We were waiting on just new weapon code, things like that. Uh, we had to keep going over these levels. And like, I had a whole bunch of levels that you can probably find it if you Google it. Somebody, uh, somebody on uh, uh, on uh, Twitter f like found the link at one point a few months ago um, where we were just cranking out shit. And at some point we're like, we got to wrap this up. You know, like, you know, this is costing money. You know, and the irony was, you know, the majority of us uh, were contractors at that point. Yeah. And so, you know, when Vortex Rikers came about, you know, uh, we had to come up with like a fiction, you know, with this this planet and these crashed ships. And then I was like, well, how about, you know, one of the lessons I learned years later uh, from Eric Nyland, who helped uh, write the first Gears, was, you know, to have a character have some sort of growth, even though there wasn't really a character in Unreal. Um, start, you know, beat them down at the beginning. You know, um, Stu Beatty, who wrote the first draft of the Gears of War film, told me a, a good movie is one where a character does something at the end of the movie that you wouldn't expect at the beginning. You know that character arc that happens and you know mm -hmm. to start the player as prisoner 849 i believe it was um in a prison cell you know looking up at the ceiling you know and then to have them finally get off that planet and essentially finally find their freedom was you know kind of the meta arc even though it was no you know fucking citizen kane um yeah, but yeah i mean we, we were just you know just drilling away all day long you know a bunch of us in a war room level designers you know uh you know trying to make weapons that i, I always wanted to again zig whenever other people zagged you know when it came to the weapons i didn't want to do the standard shotgun 
kind of weapon that was, yeah. you know, Doob and, and Quake were famous for. You know, James Schmaltz, uh, the co-designer and the guy who, you know, uh, you know, runs Digital Extremes, you know, made uh, Pariah and Warframe and things like that. He came up with this idea of the flak cannon, you know, and I was like, oh, my God, we're, you know, we're going to have alternate fires. And it, it's funny, it goes back to, you know, I was at E3 in Atlanta many years ago. And I remember uh, hearing Mark Rain's boisterous voice say, oh, my God, check it out. Miyamoto's playing Unreal. And I was like, I lost my shit because here's my hero. Yeah. Here, here's the person why I'm doing this in the first place, playing my game. And I, I kind of went over and awkwardly took the controls from him. It was like showing off the regular and the alternate fires, and the, the fact that you could dodge and how good the environments looked and things like that. And he was kind of stoic, you know, but he was just kind of scoping out, you know, other games on the show floor. And like, yeah. I was like, I was like this afterwards, like, you know, I've met like, you know, my share of like filmmakers, uh, actors, models, porn stars, even like I've never been shooken like that before. Like I met Spielberg and I was just like, I love his work. I respect the shit out of him. But I was just like, hey, how's it going? You know, like Miyamoto to me is just a god. And, you know, yeah. to, be able to introduce my wife to him at some point. And same thing with Kojima-san, by the way. Um, I don't know how I became friends with him. It's fucking weird. Um, you know, I, I guess I was on a panel at uh, E3 during the Gears One time frame, 2005, 2006, and uh, he was demoing uh, the next Metal Gear, and he was just showing a cutscene because you know he loves his cutscenes. And I demoed the same Gears One demo that I did, and uh, he and I got photos, like acting like we were doing karaoke with the mics. And um, you know, he he, I kept in touch with his former producer Ken at the time, and uh, I wound up at a uh, PAX uh, West. Uh, years later, and I wound up, you know, at a, a party to celebrate Metal, Metal Gear's 20th anniversary, and then they wound up putting me in the spot to do a speech in front of everybody, and I was like, "What the fuck is life right now?" Like, and I talked about like, you know, reading the Nintendo Fun Club back in the day, which I still have the issues, and they advertised the first Metal Gear, and like how that game made such an impression on me with the, the you know, the controllable missile and things like that, and all the, the the gear that you had, and the crazy cool story and things like that. And, you know, there's the saying, guys, they say, don't meet your heroes. They'll disappoint you. 90% of them that I've met have been fucking awesome. You know, and, you know, you know when Boss Key was uh, starting to unfurl and unravel after when Lawbreakers was imploding, you know, I took my, uh, my wife's family to Tokyo. And I had dinner with Kojima-san and Ken, his producer, former producer now. And, uh, you know, he told me, you know, over drinks at the hotel bar afterwards, he said, you know, through Ken, the translator, he said, um, you know, you, d you did something. You started your own studio and you shipped a game. And he was mid working on Death Stranding. And he's like, I've started my studio and I haven't even shipped a game yet. Like you did, you did, you did it, you know, like keep going. And that's when I realized, you know, I wanted to at least try one more time and make Radical Heights. And then the hackers hit, you know, so, but yeah, it's, it's so weird to, you know, same thing with Tim Schafer from uh, Double Fine. Yeah. You know, like Tim came to a Lawrence in my wedding, you know, with, uh, with his wonderful wife. And uh, it was one of those things that I pulled him aside, you know, halfway through the wedding. And I said, you know, I was a lifelong fan of yours uh, and I'm proud to call you a friend now, you know, and it, my wedding was such a hilarious who's who of different industry people. It was uh, one day I'll leak the video, but it's, uh, you know, we're looking forward to that. Yeah. But yeah, it, it, was, actually, it actually reminds me of, of, of when you and I first met, because it was kind of a similar story. I think the first time we ever hung out was uh, in Boston. I think it was Boston at uh, one of the PAX at, East. One, one of the PAXs, yeah. We were at the uh, the Boss Key thing. Actually, when you introduced Boss Key for the very first time and showed some concept art and screenshots of Lawbreakers before it was oh, at, 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 at the panel. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And and I, I had the you know exact same thing. You know, I, I was a guy who had been looking up to you and your games for such a long time. And then, you know, at, at, in some weird coincidence, I I ended up. Uh, going on a date with, uh, with with Paula, and then we ended up ho hooking up with you and uh, and Lauren, and then we just went off in a taxi somewhere, and then we just partied with you and the rest of the Lawbreakers guys. And uh, I remember meeting Tramel, you know, he was an old three year olds guy, and hanging out with, with with all of you, and it was just such a fun experience. Yeah, um, and just realizing that you were actually just the nicest guy, and and you know, I saw so many things in you that I noticed in myself, you know, when I started making games, uh, you know, around 10 years ago, um, 
so so there's a lot of similarities and and I could see a lot of those things in in myself that you had been through which was kind of a unique experience because you know you look up to these heroes and I'm sure Kojima was probably a huge fan of you without you even realizing it you know well him- first first off uh, uh I remember being very well dressed um <laughs> I remember you having good alcohol tolerance um we're still close friends with Powell, by the way for the record yeah um and uh it, it's funny because you know it goes into uh you know, being a lifelong fan of iced tea, you know, and the dude's a legend. You know, I remember uh, my Facebook memories reminded me of when I, you know, at E3 years ago when he and I demoed Gears 3 on stage and just exchanging stories with him. Um, and I remember he was talking about like robbing jewelry stores back in the day. And I was like, Ice, did, did you use like a hammer or something? And he held out his hands and there were scars in his hands because they would just oh, smash, and, smash and grab. Like he's seen some shit, right? And then to be able to cast him you know, multiple times in Gears as well as uh, he did some VO for uh, Lawbreakers. Mm -hmm. Then to see him, you know, endure as this success coming from nothing, you know, it's like, you know, to meet, you know, the guy who inspired you, it's so fucking weird because I would listen to his rap uh, lyrics talking about, you know, I had nothing and I wanted it, you had everything and you flaunted it, thinking about it. And, uh, you know, I, I would apply that to software development in some weird, twisted way. And then when I first met him, you know, it turns out, you know, he, as you know, he's a big gamer. His Twitter handle's Final Level. And he actually, you know, played all of my work. He played, like, Unreal and Unreal Tournament. And it was so meta to realize, like, you know, as I was building the games, like, that he would later play, I was listening to his music as inspiration. Yeah. You know, so it's, that's another full whole... circle. Matrix, see? Yeah. So I wanted to bring up the Matrix thing. Fred, if you look up behind Cliff, that is a signed set list from, what, a body count show? Yep. That, oh, hey. <laughs> so I this is really weird that you we've come into the talking about Ice T thing because I talk about Ice T quite often on my podcast. Like I'm a big fan of his also. He's, I had, a, he's a fucking le- he's a legend. I had no idea that this was going to come up coming into this interview. So we're definitely in the matrix. But I I talk about this uh he was on Jamie Josta's podcast uh, from Hate Breed and he gave this really long monologue talking about just not just the industry of music, but just how you connect with an audience, period. And his whole thing was that like it's way better to just you know own your own shit and to connect with a few people who really, truly fuck with what you're doing, you know, who really care about the thing that you're doing. And that gives me a lot of inspiration about what I'm doing here and about what Fred's doing and all of these, everything that we're talking about here. Because... His whole point was that it's better to fill up a small room with people who all care and take 100% of that profit than it is to sell yourself to a company, sell a million copies of something, and not even get you know half of 1% off of it. And then you have a real human connection with your, with your audience and the people that you care about. Ice-T is such an inspirational fucking guy. Like, he's amazing. I, I love Body Count. Like, I'm a big heavy metal fan. And I like his rap music too, but just like I, I came along a little later in his career. So cool, man. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, we uh, helped uh, reunite Body Count for a uh, party at uh, uh, E3 for uh, Gears 3. Mm-hmm. And I got to introduce them. And I got to say, Body Count, motherfuckers! <laughs> um, it's actually a fun anecdote. Um, you know, we're sitting there. Uh, there's a party uh, that was in downtown LA at this place that used to be like an old water processing plant. Uh, it has a very Bioshock vibe. Yeah. And uh, Ice, Ice and Coco came to the party along with uh, Jace Hall and uh, Alicia Marie, the fitness model uh, girlfriend of his. Um, and uh, we're sitting there, and, like, they're all, like, fucking, like, Navi. Like, they're all, like, tall and imposing. I'm 5'9". You know, Lauren's, like, 5'4". And there's this photo of us, like, all together. We, Lauren and I look like we're, like, mini-me's, right? And uh, Coco shows up, and she's a total fucking sweetheart. Um, but And she smelled like sunless tanner, right? And uh, it's a very distinct smell. I can st- Lauren still uses that stuff occasionally. It's better than regular tanning. And Coco was wearing a very loose-fitting shirt. And her shirt just fell down. And her big old beautiful titty just fell right out. And Lauren's like my – wife, my wife's like super like shy and meek. And Lauren's like, um, Coco, um, um, your, your boob. And she's like, oh, don't worry. <laughs> she's like, don't worry about it, honey. It happens all the time. And uh, it's just like – it's one of those things like I can text Ice-T. You know, like I was texting him about the rioting that was going on because – you know, he warned us about all this shit 30 years ago. Yes. You know, I'm old enough to remember the fucking L.A. riots. You know, the thing, one of the lyrics that he had was like, cops hate kids and kids hate cops. Cops kill kids with warning shots. 30 fucking years ago. 
And, you know, I know there are good fucking cops out there, but if I have to see one more video of some, some poor unarmed, per, unarmed person getting fucking shot or beat, I'm just like, it just, I, I hate to get political for a second, but it just feels like we're at this crazy tipping point in this country, which has such deeply ingrained racism. Um, and it's, it, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling, but the other one uh, is uh, Joe Rogan. Um, you know, having watched his work on like news radio and then, to, you know, doing his podcast, you know, I call Joe uh, kind of like a woke bro. You know, he says a lot of smart shit. He occasionally says some dumb shit. Um, he has guests that I'm not a big fan of. <laughs> uh, I'll leave it at that um, to, you know, try to get like the other side of stories and things like that. You know, it's a thing you think about like provocateurs like Tommy Laren and things like that. I had this epiphany many years ago, and I know we're not talking about games. We'll get back on that. But, you know, people like Rush Limbaugh might not believe an actual word of what's coming out of their fucking mouth. Mm -hmm. All they see is a profit center, you know, Tucker Carlson, you know, pundits like that in the States. And, you know, they're more dangerous now than ever because all they're doing is fanning the fires of division in this country that have been so flamed up by 45 and by social media, you know. And then yeah. anyway, back to video games. That's fine. You can talk about whatever you want and then I'll, <laughs> I'll cut all the video game stuff and put it in the, in the conventions cut and then we'll release the, the real unedited raw version on our YouTube channel, it'd be fun. Well, it's it's funny, it's funny, Ty, because uh, the thing is, uh, you know, with me being a public figure, you know, I, I've had this trend where, you know, whenever I was at a convention or, uh, you know, and I get recognized, you know, I would go out of my way to get a photo and be friendly. What do you like? What are you playing right now? You know, and, you know, even, you know, one of my favorite things to do, you know, is at a convention to be at, like one of the, you know, I'm a bit of a drinker, to be at a hotel bar or like, you know, just like an Irish pub. And then if I ever get recognized, would be to get the fan hammered just to buy them a bunch, a bunch of drinks. Um, and it's so funny because, you know, going back to, you know, not being a fan of 45, one of the few things I agree with him about is the media's way to twist things. Mm -hmm. You know, and I could do an interview where I'm like, oh, Kojima's a friend of mine. I love his games, but I think his cutscenes are a little, a little bit long. The poll quote would be, Blazinski says Kojima's a pedophile. You know? <laughs> and then, you know, the, somebody actually threw it back in my face. Back in the day, I had a quote. What I said, essentially, a person who's smart enough to upgrade their video card, you know, is probably smart enough to BitTorrent, you know, because PC gaming at the time was in a state of, quote, disarray. Mm. And that made the PC community go, ah, but PC gaming at the time was because Steam hadn't really proliferated. High-speed internet hadn't really prolifer uh, proliferated. Uh, retail video games were being consumed by used games at, at game stores. Like, you know, it was a sad section with, you know, PC games in the boxes all crumpled and shit, right? Like, it wasn't fucking disarray, you know? And later, you know, everything turned around, but I was right at the time. And then it was like, yeah, and, you know, I think the community got so defensive because they were fucking pirating. Like, I know game developers that would fucking pirate. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? Like, you work in the industry. You're like, you're self-cannibalizing at this point. I know game developers who shall not be named who have an entire servers where they download torrents of movies and watch them and i'm like dude what the fuck like you know you get it you, you work in games you get a decent salary you can pay the fucking five bucks to rent you know uncle buck or whatever right like jesus but yeah it's like the thing is this you know i've seen my words twisted twisted time again and the way that the internet works especially with clickbait culture is find sensationalist headline jump to comments yeah you know npr did a bit a few years ago which was their april fool's uh, prank where they said even NPR, which is usually filled with like you know left-leaning eggheads, was um, new, new study finds that people don't read, and then it was like if you actually read the article, it said this is just our April Fool's joke to see if you actually <laughs> read, read this, and then people immediately went to the comments like fuck you, I read, you know, and like we we live in this you know this world of bite-sized entertainment, bite-sized mm -hmm. culture, 240 character tweets, social media posts. It's like you look at like um, you know engagement on social media and facebook introduced that stupid thing where like instead of just actually typing normal text you can make it like big and like with a purple background and shit mm. turning it into, into fucking myspace and it's the same thing on like uh twitter it's like if you don't have like some sort of catchy meme or like an image to go along with your text or like you know the giant font you know the the the, the meme font you know like no one reads it everyone's just scrolling through the addictive feed which is surgically built to be addictive to, to get you to the next one to get to fucking outrage you know, so I always say with everything in the world, always follow the fucking money. So I really think it's really it's interesting how preoccupied you guys are with social media because, like, I am the key generation for that, and I don't have any of it. I have Discord, 
and then I like the keep has a Twitter page, but Fred had to like talk me into making a Facebook account to communicate with you because I was like almost even if you're on the other side of it, I'm like oh I don't know if I want to have a Facebook account because that can open up such a can of worms and I, I don't know I feel like uh, there's there's almost a divide in in my generation between the people who fall into that trap and the people who are really savvy and see that coming and just don't want to be part of it or at least have a more measured way of looking at it than a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, I think it's a healthier attitude to have. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, for me, I have two types of days during this pandemic. I have the day where I get up and I, I, I write a little bit um, and then I just read the news feed. It's like I'm picking, I'm like picking like a scab, you know, or like, you know, sniffing bad milk, like, oh, this smells bad, smell it. You know, um, and reading the news, the news feed of what's going on. Um, I do enjoy engaging with people who like like my work on social. You know, I, I have a really weird collection of eclectic people that follow me. Like some actress from uh, Westworld just followed me on Twitter. Like, like it's just it, it's weird. But uh, you know, Facebook for me, I don't add anybody on Facebook that I don't personally know. You know, and and I say yeah, I can say that I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the things Zuck has done. But I'm also at odds with myself because I'm a shareholder, yeah. you know, so it's like the thing about Facebook, it's not just about Facebook. That's the thing that Zuck realizes being the lizard man robot that he is, is that um, he, it's about VR. It's about the long term game. It's about bringing Internet to places that uh, didn't exist. But there's also the scary side of it, that Cambridge Analytica shit, you know, about your personal data. And yeah. there's, there, the adage that people say is, you know, when the product's free, you're the product. You know, and, the, you know, the, the one platform that I've actually enjoyed more than any of these past days is fucking Instagram. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, same here. People are really, really nice on Instagram. And, you know, like it's, you know, like the comments are cool and, you know, you get to see, you know, butts and stuff like that. And You can also and, filter out your own your own stuff. Like, like my Instagram is private. And, and so whenever I put something on Instagram, it's as much for myself to have this section where I can keep good memories with my fiance and my daughter. And and I can always load it up. Like if if you know if you have my parents over or something like that, I can load it up and you know I can show them. Hey, we did this that day, or we went there and so on. So it's more like a, a photo album kind of yeah, thing like, where you it's like, it's like scrapbooking. Exactly, and yeah. you have your closest friends and and maybe someone you don't know personally, but someone who who is not a troll because you can just fill them out. And, yeah, 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 I, I agree. It's it's funny because I, I remember uh, you know uh, the girl that I was dating for a few years after my first marriage, um, who was in the MTV special for Gears One. Um, she uh, I remember her showing me her laptop because she was at NC State at the time, and she uh, was like, "Oh, this is this new website that was made by this guy out of I think it was Harvard, and you have to have like an EDU address, you know, to actually join." And it's so funny that like Zuck made that website to like vote on girls that they thought yeah. were pretty. You know, that's the further proof that technology and the internet are driven by thirsty dudes. Did you hear that the social network was uh, when Tarantino, he did his, uh, was it like top 50 or something of, of the best movies of, of this century? And he kept revealing one at a time. Mm -hmm. I think the, the second one was uh, Christopher Nolan, uh, Dunkirk. Yep. And number one was uh, the social network. David Fincher. Came as yeah. a huge surprise. Yeah, well, first off, Dunkirk bothered me because I hate PG-13 World War II movies. Yeah. Um, I think it does a disservice to the, the hor horrors of that war. That's why I love Saving Private Ryan, even though yeah. Dunkirk was a fantastic film. Um, 1917, by the way, is fucking great, too. Oh, that's, my God. That's a fantastic amazing. movie. I, I'm, a, yeah. I'm like a World War One, like, connoisseur. I really love I – don't, I don't like war, but, I mean, like, I love the history of yeah. that particular war. And that movie was, like, such a beautifully well put together – visual idea of what it was like to be in the trenches and then go over the top and it's all done in one shot. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Well, yeah. That's the thing. It's, you know, like one of my primary duties getting back to games uh, mm -hmm. when I was at Epic was taking screenshots. You know, like right. if you go back, um, uh, Todd uh, you know, sent me the uh, next generation issue where we got the cover and it was like, yes, this is an actual PC screenshot. It's called Unreal, right? And like, ha like three quarters of the screenshots inside that article were ones that I had staged. You know, so many of the Unreal Tournament first screenshots that came out were ones that I staged. Then you realize that taking a screenshot is an art form. It's fucking photography. Yeah. You know, you're you're literally framing it. You know, in the same. You know, ironically, uh, there's there, there's a Twitter account called One Perfect Shot that follows me on Twitter now, um, which I've been following for quite some time, and they point out like One Perfect Shot, and like I've uh, you know, for lack of a better term, taught Lauren to spot good shots or like single takes. 
and like you know, knowing what goes into filmmaking and game making that when you see like the art of the camera and where the camera angle is and the framing and and the timing you know what what, what the camera can suggest you know like the, the classic like you know person a girl's in her kitchen and like the camera's kind of at the bushes outside implying somebody's in, there's so much to cinematography that's yeah. there you know and it's 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 really an art form the thing about the social network which is a fucking great movie um is the fact that even if you don't give a shit about facebook like it's it's still a really really compelling yeah. movie it, it, it goes the same thing with uh, my brother's friends with uh, billy bean uh who uh, uh ran the o- okay, yeah so. ran the o- yeah because yeah. um, my brother founded sportsblogsnation.com as well as uh, vox media um, and it's one of those things that, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big baseball guy. You know, I went to a few Red Sox games as a kid, you know, it's, it, you know, they even sped the game up a few years ago cause it was too snoozy. There's a reason why there's a seventh inning stretch where everyone has to stand up and stretch their fucking legs. Um, but the thing is, you know, Moneyball is a compelling movie, even if you don't care about, you know, baseball, you know? So that's the same thing about like, you know, if we were to ever do like, you know, a, a, a TV show about, you know, making a video game. You know, it, it doesn't. You, you don't have to be a video game fan to appreciate it. You know, like yeah. so. Maybe my book one day will be a Netflix series or some shit. I don't know. You know well, let, let's he, let's hear a bit uh, a bit about the book because I, I remember when you started working on it and and it was just these little snippets here and there on on Facebook, little quotes of of things you were starting to put down and you know now it, it sounds like it's it's turning into a real thing. Like what what's the uh, yeah? What's I'm official. Uh, the current status of it I'm, I'm working on is I'm at the gears one part. Uh, where I moved out from my first marriage, um, about to meet the girl who had become a girlfriend during the Gears One time frame, uh, you know, living in a five hundred fifty dollar apartment across from Epic with rented furniture, uh, being completely miserable, and through the divorce, losing everything that I'd worked up to at that point, mm-hmm. which is why I named Marcus Phoenix Marcus Phoenix in the first place because I myself was hoping to rise from the ashes. Um, but yeah, so my writing partner um, is a guy named Todd Gold. Um, he uh, wrote uh, "Little Girl Lost," which was Drew, Drew Barrymore's uh, memoir. I uh, wrote Anne Margaret's. He wrote one by the about the Osbournes. Like he has stories about being embedded in uh, Japan with uh, in Tokyo with Michael Jackson. Like I I finally met him in Los Angeles before the lockdown. He's showing me photos of him with Bubbles the Chimp. Like you know he was embedded in the '80s with Madonna in London. You know, and he just has like story after story after story of all the like. Um, Ty, did you ever see the movie uh, Almost Famous? I don't think so, no. Uh, it's this uh, guy, Cameron Crowe, directed it and wrote it. And it was a semi-autobiographical story about being embedded with rock stars. Uh, Kate Hudson stars in it. It's, uh, it's a classic. You should uh, look it up. It's a great movie. It's on the list. But it's going on the he list. Worked, he worked with him at People Magazine in the 80s. And, like, Todd had that same experience, you know, like, just hanging with rock stars and celebrities and things like that. Mm-hmm. And he, the, the biggest thing about the book, guys, is that – you know, first off, you know, I, I hope I don't get fucking sued because, you know, uh, A, I'm not going to reveal any trade secrets and B, 99% of what I'm saying is already public knowledge. Uh, and also in regards to my personal life, many names will be changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> or they're not so innocent. Yeah. Yeah. Fred, you know, you, you've been, you, I don't know, Ty, if you've been at gaming conventions, but there's a lot of hooking up going on at those. Um, so I'm going to have, there will be some salacious details without naming names. Um you know, imagine being a pimply faced, uh, broke nerd who then goes on to become a rock star. Like it, yeah. it's, it's quite the journey, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's my, my kind of arc, you know, and it's the, the yeah. biggest takeaway from it is me learning how to actually write, you know, and I'll, I'll write like a, ch- a chapter, you know, and then Todd will send it back to me like a fucking school teacher who's just bled all over your pages. <laughs> like, what were you feeling at this point? Put me in the room. What did this person look like? What did what were you smelling? What were you listening to music wise at the time? You know, little things like mentioning, you know, like you know having a, you know the O.J. Simpson chase on in the background, you know, which wound yeah. up in, yeah. in Duke Nukem, you know, like yeah. 9, 9-11. You know, I remember, you know, when I first uh, was uh, scouting out Raleigh when Epic wanted to move me here in the nineties, and I remember sitting in the hotel, um, watching uh, the news and seeing Bill Clinton go, "I did not have sexual relations with that woman." You know, like, you know, it's like Forrest Gump, like timestamps, yeah, you know, throughout. I was going to bring that up. It's like you when you pepper in little historical details, it really makes you if you can remember a moment that a lot of people also collectively remember, it can really tie you to like where you're at. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it really it, 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 it's it's kind of like, a, you know, a moment in time. Like if you guys watched uh, Kong, mm-hmm. right, like what Jordan Voight Roberts, um, who come, came to my party and I'm friends somehow. 
Um, he uh, he might be doing some Metal Gear movie stuff too. Um, that movie, you know, if you look at the Vietnam era, that music, you know, Jimi Hendrix and all that is so much of the era. Yeah. And you know, the, and the thing is, is you know, um, you know, uh, um, during the fall of my first marriage, you know, there were two songs I would listen to on repeat. And just as my ex-wife was asleep in the other bedroom, uh, and I was in the living living room, I put the CD on, and I listened to Mad World, and Evanescence is my immortal. Pop, yeah, but still, those songs resonated with me. And there's more to it there, which we'll get to in the book. Um, but yeah, and uh, the irony was that you know uh, the Microsoft marketing firm somehow through the Matrix found that song to propose it to me, and as I'm being filmed for an MTV special they play that they wanted to juxtapose the game trailer, you know, for the first gears commercial with mad world. And like, if you look up the special and you can see the look at my face, like yeah. how the fuck, like the sadness, even though gears is a visceral, violent, you know, bro, bro, bro franchise, there's a lot of sadness in it, mm-hmm. you know? And I often joke that, you know, I made my best games in my career when I was the most miserable, yeah. you know, and that's, that was it's my because favorite. games becomes an escapism. You know, when when you're the most miserable, you want to escape the most, and that's when when you make your finest art. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, like I say, there's a reason why Van Gogh cut off his ear. You mm-hmm. know, and like game developers are the term that I use repeatedly is they're they're from the land of misfit toys. You know, they they were usually not the ones who were going to prom. You know, they usually you know, and it's usually it's changed lately, but it's usually just uh, you know cis het straight whatever you say these days uh, white dudes. You know, and that's the thing about Boss Key. It was like anytime somebody applied and they showed up in person and they weren't that, I was like, thank God, because it allowed me to try and depict characters that were from a, a myriad of backgrounds and and not make them bad stereotypes. Right. You know, because as great as the Coltrane was, it was, uh, you know, the classic black charismatic athlete stereotype, you know, and, um, you know, like a but still a lovable, like, like, you know, the, the whole the whole scene with his wife and Gears 2 and like. By the way, one of the most emotional scenes in, uh, oh, sorry, that's not Cold Trail, but the wife scene, anyways, in, in Gears 2 was one of the most memor- uh, memorable scenes I have from that whole series. One of the most emotional as well. I think that's one of the first times I really, it really stuck to me that, wow, games can, can really portray emotion that way. Well, it's, it's two things there. First off, it was my statement on being uh, pro uh, uh, allow people who are uh, sick and want to die to die. You know, like Jack Kevorkian, you know, the whole like during the time I was uh, the memory of Terry Schiavo was there, uh, the woman who was in a vegetative state and her parents, you know, were keeping her, you know, on machines with with hope that she would come back when you the, the doctor doctors confirmed that she wasn't going to. Um, you know, there's a lot of people like keep politics out of games. It's like the Gears franchise was a thinly veiled metaphor for the Iraq war, you fucking idiots, yeah. you know, and then, uh, you know, that, that game got a lot of flack. At the time, for like the dialogue, stupid and everything like that. It's a broke. And then I, I, I take solace sometimes when I go to YouTube and I look up scenes like Dom's death or Dom killing his wife, uh, essentially putting her down, or even Ty putting the shotgun in his mouth um, after being tortured so much. And uh, the comments are almost all universally like, "This made me cry," blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. you know. And it's 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 vindication on the back end for all of that. And Gears will always hold a special dear place in my heart it changed my life um you know i'll never forget seeing people show me tattoos yeah. of the franchise that was like one of the biggest highs and then you know there's like people out there with jazz jackrabbit tattoos you know and even you know people who got lawbreakers tattoos you know and you know it's it's a little sad to have a you know a, a brand on you from a defunct game but you know it's still you know and you know the thing is transitioning to broadway producing and um you know doing Hades town and to see people get Hades town tattoos now. And, you know, it was, uh, the much needed win that I had last year was to be, you know, first off at opening night of Hades town um, and to see how magical it was. Um, and then to be at the Tony awards and then to be in the room when it won eight Tonys, including yeah. best, including best musical, because, you know, provided Broadway was open, that means, you know, it, it becomes profitable. You know, I've already made my money back. But, um, you know, it's it, it was a much needed win for me because I had been so crestfallen for a damn near a year after the studio imploded. So and that's the thing. It's like, you know, like I, I, I love Broadway. I, I think the power of a good musical has the ability to change minds. And I think more games could do that. You know, I, I'm, I'm reading about some of the things in The Last of Us 2 
uh, you know, with Ellie and her having a girlfriend and things like that. And, you know, we'll get your politics out of my game. It's like uh, gay people exist, motherfucker. Like, you know, like what the fuck? You know, like Chris Rock says, y'all yeah. get at least a gay cousin. Y'all get at least a gay cousin. And by the way, Naughty Dog, man, like, you know, I have so much respect for them. Oh, but flawless. Yeah. Really Absolutely killing. flawless. It's yeah. just, I just, I hear horror stories about the hours that are required, you know, to, to pull off what they do. And it just, it, it, it breaks my heart because, you know, I just, I, they are leading edge for like, you know, frontline for, like, for Sony, for selling Playstations, for cinematic storytelling. I remember when Uncharted 2 came out, the entire industry had Uncharted 2 envy. Mm. Like, because Uncharted 2 was the classic, like, this is the example of, like, a guy who marries a woman who doesn't play games. Yeah. It's the whole, like, oh, my wife watches it and she thinks it's cinematic, you know? And I'm like, you know, it's the whole thing where, I, you know, if, if you're a dude and you love games, you know, I was telling Fred earlier, like, now more than ever, more women play all types of games, girls play games all the time. Like, it's not that hard to find a gamer girl to play with you. You have this thing called the internet, you know, like, you know, just don't be a weird incel douche. And, you know, like, maybe you'll meet one. I mean, I mean, I met my wife through video games. You know, she was working at it at the time. She was the QA tester and the build manager. And I, I saw her on MySpace huh, dating myself now. And I said, that's that's going to be my next girlfriend. Um, and I made it happen. And uh, and then when Crunch, she, we did a, a long distance, uh, 19 weekends in a row. I was able to fly her to Raleigh Friday night. Flyer in Monday morning, driver to the airport, uh, and then in was going to crunch on Rage, and uh, I'm like, "Fuck this, move in with me, quit your job." And uh, it's so funny because she was working with Carmack directly, and she had no idea who he was. He was just <laughs> like whatever. Yeah, she was just he was just one of her bosses, yeah. and, uh, and he would give her an iPhone to test Doom Mobile on it, and she'd give feedback on the controls. And it's so funny because she left before Rage shipped, and Rage was a fucking good game, man. It just yeah. got. Over overpowered by borderlands just talking it's, about uh, mad max earlier god i love that game dude yeah it's uh but the thing the, the, ki the kicker was on the console uh well they made they made a couple mistakes first mistake was not having proper deathmatch they had that stupid racing mode you're in like do deathmatch um the other thing was the uh the friction and adhesion and controls on the console were totally slippery and not very very good at all with, especially with like the, the faster moving enemies and uh lauren was like yeah that was better i gave feedback on that before i left and i think somebody like you know fucked it up or something like that but you know uh, you know i found myself a, a, a kind smart beautiful gamer girl and i locked her down she's my forever person you know and now more than ever if you're a gamer and you want to find somebody who plays games you know first off don't gatekeep by the way um, a friend of mine, uh, the brilliant uh, writer Lee Alexander, once posted on social, "Oh, you claim you're a gamer girl? Fuck you! What's Mario's inseam? You know yes. that whole thing, right? Yeah. Well, my, my wife sees herself as like a, an evangelist for games. She has a, a bunch of girlfriends that never played games before, and she has them all in. You know, she, a bunch of them came to town before the pandemic, and they had a big fucking World of Warcraft LAN party in my fucking VR living room." Like, you know, like she gets her girlfriends, you know, like playing, you know, Animal Crossing and everything like that. It's like, you know, she, you know, the, here's the thing about Animal Crossing, by the way, is there's always a dude bro character for some reason. Like I've been uh, slacking on the workout front and he's like, oh, you'd be getting swole, bro. And I'm get the fuck out of my town, motherfucker. Um, my wife micromanages my my uh, Animal Crossing. Like, you know, we just recently did the uh, IGN uh, charity live stream yesterday mm -hmm. and they asked me if I wanted to do it. I'm like, my my. My island is shit. I'm literally trolling my island. I have, like, when you fly into my island, I have a giant banner, like uh, the movie Castaway, and it says, send nudes on it on the beach. <laughs> and I, I decided to make my beaches polluted, so I, I went back to do, do, like, pixel art, where I made, like, oil slicks that are all, all over the beach. I made cigarette butts, and I because I found an oil drum, and I put the oil drum on the beach, and then, I'll, like, when I find the boots and the, the tires, I put them all on the beach, and I'm just, like, trolling my island at this point. Um, I made uh, signs that say "Occupy Tom Nook" and "Tom Nook is a crook" and and then "I love butts" and things like that. I put the link right in front of Tom Nook's house and things like that. Um, so we went to. Uh, I said I opted. I'm like, let's do Lauren's island because her her island is absolutely fucking batshit. Because you know, you know, with the pandemic, our schedules are all fucked. So we get up at like noon every fucking day, and I wake up and I take my eye mask off and I look over and I see her with the glow of her switch just going. And she's completely brought out of space at her, on her fucking island. It's just, like, ridiculous. She has, like, an arcade. She has a restaurant with, like, a, a secret employee entrance. Like, it's fucking hardcore. If you have a chance, look up the uh, IGN charity stream. Yeah, uh, I, I saw yesterday. Uh, I posted a link about it. I'm definitely going to check it out. 
you know, it was good. So, yeah, uh, any uh, – we might, might want to start wrapping this up. We've been going yeah, on for a while. Yeah, damn, one and a half hour. That uh, is going to be a record. So the last, yeah. the last couple of things that I wanted to get into were – Yeah, man. First of all, do you still run the beer garden? You still got that thing going on out there? I don't run it. Mm-hmm. Uh, more of a silent partner. Um, it's got like 387 beers on tap. Uh, it's won three Guinness World Records. Uh, one is for the number largest number of beers on tap. The other one's for the largest number of breweries. And I can't even remember what the third one is right now. Like I have the two uh, placards hanging downstairs. Um, yeah, but it's uh, one of those things. The key to the restaurant business. Okay. There's a movie called The Founder that I highly recommend. Yeah, love it. Um, and this is the girl that I dated before Lauren. Uh, her family's in the restaurant business. And they taught me to own the land whenever you can. And, you know, at the end of the movie, it's, you know, uh, Ty, it's about the, you know, the founders of McDonald's, the McDonald's brothers, and then Ray Kroc, who's the businessman who uh, kind of learned how to franchise McDonald's, but also to buy the real estate so you can be your own uh, landlord. And uh, that's one thing my business partner in our two restaurants, he's got many more, um, taught me is like, if you own the land, you build a restaurant on the land, the land appreciates because of the restaurant, go to another bank and refinance, shave off the money. And then you can take the money you're making from one restaurant and use it to start another restaurant, right? Just, you know, show up and make sure that, you know, like the place is running smoothly. And, you know, I don't, I don't like micromanage it. Like, I'll just be like, Hey, can we get coat hooks underneath the bar here? Like, cause mm-hmm. my wife can't, can't hang her fucking purse. That's pretty much the extent of it. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, it was doing swimmingly before the pandemic. It's a fucking sprawling, quite the impressive uh, setup. But my uh, business partner uh, actually did another one in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, and he asked me, he's like, Hey, do you, uh, you know, do you want to do another one? And I'm like, two restaurants are all the risk I can handle right now. Like, you know, I'm a big believer in diversifying money. You know, uh, you know, if you have a little bit of money, you know, put some in stocks, put some in real estate, put some in, you know, and maybe in hospitality, you know, I think it's a, it's, you know, ironically, you know, the restaurants are, you know, limping along during the pandemic, Broadway shut down, but before the pandemic, I would say it's a pretty telling sign that I would rather invest our own money into the restaurant business or Broadway over actually spending money like on a video game studio. That's how risky I think the video game industry is. And if I get back into it, it will be something small. And I, again, I say like my biggest mistake with Bosky wasn't doing a small game first so we could learn how to work together. We went, try to go triple A and we wound up double A essentially. That's what I'm I'm actually looking forward to that more than anything. If you do something like that, I'm certain that if you take that time to like make it a small project and just do what you actually feel passionate about and really key that in, it's going to be a masterpiece. There's no other way around that. The way that you have manifested your own destiny throughout your entire life, you know, and with trials and tribulations and everything, but the way that you speak about like, I had a goal, I did everything in my power to accomplish that is sim. It's so inspiring. Like, we talked about that with Ice T earlier, with Joe Rogan, like all these people, like that. It's something that you have in common with other great titans of this industry, like yourself, is that you guys are not afraid to take risks and not afraid to work your ass off to get where you want to be. And then once you get there, you know how to enjoy it. And that's so. Cool. And, and, and don't don't be afraid to fail. Yeah. You know, like that's yeah. one thing I you know I remind myself about. Like you know when I talk about Boss Key, you know Steven Spielberg has had flops. You know Will Smith has had flops. After Earth flopped. Right. Like, you know, the the key is to get back on that horse, you know, which is the thing in the back of my head that makes me want to maybe one day do it again. I mean, I think I tweeted that I have a a new IP that I'm kind of noodling on. um, And it's actually really interesting. It's not even a shooter. And I just love, you know, like I was talking about ice with the white paper of blue lines, like, you know, we open at this place, you know, I'm literally like also have like a uh, downloaded the app fade in right. my friend, uh, Gary Widow, who was doing animal talking. I, I asked him like what screenwriting software he used and he, this is the one he recommended, um, you know, maybe write like a, you know, a screenplay or something and like, you know, just keep, keep, be the shark and keep moving and just, you know, don't just sit there on Reddit and social media all day long, you know, like. You know, if I get something done throughout the day, if I bust out a few pages in the book or if I, you know, noodle on some ideas or if I do, you know, improv with my wife, we even do like line readings at night. You know, we'll pr- we printed out this opening scene from Pulp Fiction and she just did the whole like Amanda Plummer. Oh, that's the cute every last one of you motherfuckers, you know, like perfectly like, you know, like that kind of stuff, you know, to, to keep you creative, but also to keep your relationship moving. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's a hard Games are a hard business to get into, but I look at, you know, uh, uh, the guy Dean Dodrell, who I did a lot of jazz stuff with back in the day, who did an amazing game called Elysian Tale. Like, he did that all fucking by himself. 
you know, when people ask me, like, how do you get into games? I'm like, you want to be a chef, start burning food. You know, like, you can download Unreal, you can download Unity, you know, like, just start chipping away, you know, and start, uh, you know, exercising that part of your fucking noodle that you may not use and just get better at it and, 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 and iterate. And it's increasingly hard, especially for the younger generation, because the prior generation has kind of fucked them. You know, it's always like, oh, b- fuck Gen Z and fuck, you know, Zoomers and, you know, fuck millennials and their avocado toast. And, you know, every week there's an article saying millennials are ruining this, ruining this that, and the other, mm-hmm. which is bullshit. Because, you know, your generation, especially, Ty, has inherited a fucked world. Um, and thank God for, you know, podcasting. Thank God for streaming. Thank God for YouTube. You know, thank God for social, mm-hmm. to for people to find a venue because, you know, it's... It, it's just not as simple that, you know, college student loans, college is a bunch of bullshit. Most of the time, you know, I know, I know friends who are struggling, who are six, six figures deep in their fucking student loans, you know, struggling in a, on a low salary in the gaming industry. You know, I never gave a fuck what somebody's degree was when I was doing the hiring at Epic. All I cared was how good their portfolio was or how good their mod they had made for a game was, how good their game design sense was, all of it. You know, the myth that you have to go to college or you're going you're to be flipping burgers is total bullshit. Uh, there are more, more venues than ever to make your own fucking path. You know, Joe Rogan was set to film or to fill stadiums. He was going to come to Raleigh and play the PNC arena where the hurricanes play. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's obviously on hold, but you know, with, he was doing podcasts before podcasts were cool, you know? And I remember like, you know, there was a big news story, brouhaha about Conan O'Brien's doing a podcast now and podcasts are in. It's like, dude, Joe was doing this forever ago. Joe, Joe gets like a list people on it. On, he had fucking yeah. Elon Musk, you know? Yeah. So just, you know, it's, it's, it goes back to that, you know, uh, Shia LaBeouf video. Just do it. Yeah. So, so that's my, uh, my Henry Rollins inspirational talk. I lo- All right. I, we got to wrap it up somehow. So the way that I wanted to wrap it up was to say, you've tried beers all around the world. You've had every kind of beer. You don't know this, but fans of this podcast know I fucking love beer. What is the best beer in the world? Where is it from? What type is it? And then what's the brand? Okay. Full confession. I actually, ironically, owning the beer garden, don't drink beer anymore. Fuck. <laughs> what do you drink now? Nothing? Water? Uh, d- depends on the time of day. Oh, I'm still lush. You know, make no mistake. I've ner- been nursing a mimosa this whole time. Um, no, so uh, what, I, what I drink when I want to drink drink is uh, I like a kettle soda uh, with a splash of ginger beer and a plenty of ice. I call it my mini mule. Because, uh, you know, being 45, I have stomach acid issues. Um, and then if it's the chill night, a little bit of red, a little bit of white wine. Um, the, the biggest thing about beer, for me at least, um, was that uh, I liked them like light and simple. You know, I liked either – I like Stella Artois, uh, Gaffel Kolsch, um, and uh, once in a while a good properly poured pint of fucking Guinness. And I used to have a bartender that would instead of doing the uh, four-leaf clover on top of it, would draw a dick uh, in the foam. Um, I'm like, you're trying to tell me something. Um, but then, uh, you know, I, I got in the habit, especially during football season, being a Saints fan mm-hmm. of just drinking Bud Light. Bud Light is shit. The problem with Bud Light is if you want to actually feel a little bit of a buzz, you have to drink 8 million of them. And then you pee out your buzz. And then you're just left with the empty calories. And I was never fatter in my life than when the couple of years when I was drinking Bud Light. And that's the, the funny thing. It's like you see, oh, it's light. It's good. It's like, yeah, it's like the people who are morbidly obese and drink diet soda. It's just like, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, it's um, – my wife uh, likes beer. Um, she likes uh, Asahi. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's funny because I'm not like that much of a beer aficionado. You know, it, it, I think it's the, the metaphor for me not drinking beer, owning the beer garden, co-owner, mind you. Um, is the same thing with me being the you know the, the video game designer who doesn't design video games anymore, you know it's uh it, to me it's a business but you know I respect the art of beer but Raleigh has you know multiple breweries the craft beer explosion has become a big thing out here and the one thing that still stymies me and mystifies me is the rise of like truly and white claw I think that shit's disgusting but what do I know that took the coolest turn I'm really glad that we ended it this way so Cliff. Thank you so much for being with us, dude. I look forward to crossing paths with you some other time for some other thing. Thanks, man. It's amazing. And yeah. Fred, Fred, good catching up, man. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for letting us have you on this uh, this interview on podcast. It was a true pleasure. I'm enjoying slightly coming out of my uh, self imposed shell these days. So cool. Thanks, guys.